Concussions are serious business. Concussions and post-concussion syndrome had a huge effect on my career. Whether you're a player, a concerned parent, a coach, a risk manager, or an executive, they're a major area of concern. HeadCheck Health has developed software and services that improve the way concussions are assessed, tracked, and managed at all levels of sport. Their goal is to create a safer environment of play by giving better tools to the individuals responsible for documenting and assessing concussions and providing better data to administrators to make real health and safety improvements. HeadCheck currently works with organizations across the country like the Canadian Junior Hockey League, BC Hockey, Rugby Ontario, the Western Lacrosse Association, and more to advance their concussion management practices. If you're interested in learning more how HeadCheck can help your team or organization, please visit HeadCheckHealth.com or email info at HeadCheckHealth.com. That's HeadCheckHealth.com or info at HeadCheckHealth.com and tell them TR sent you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode six of Third Man In. This one's a little bit different today. Uh, Charles actually isn't even here. Charles is in Toronto right now. You'll hear from him in a little bit uh, from something we recorded a couple weeks ago. I'm Mike Hickey. I am joined today by... It's me, TR, Terry Ryan. Um, and what we're doing today is something a little bit special. We're recording this on February 16th, uh, which happens to be the anniversary of the passing of a good friend of Terry's, who uh, his name keeps coming up on the podcast uh, and just in general and stories. And anytime you kind of talk about uh, anytime you kind of talk about hockey, and that's Greg Bird Dog Smith, who uh, passed away a year ago today uh, after a battle with cancer. And so we thought it would be a nice thing to do to. Uh, Take some time and talk to some former teammates and friends and, and talk about Bird Dog. I mean, TR, you want to talk sure. about this a bit more? <clears throat> well, yeah, he was, um, you know, Bird was a hockey player through and through, but he transcended the sport. Uh, he's a great fella. Uh, that's putting it mildly. Uh, when anybody that's well-liked passes away, I guess you'd tend to say he's a great fella or she's a great girl or whatever. But Bird Dog was truly unique. Uh, just to give, I, I, you know, there's going to be listeners that don't know who he is, so I'll give you, you know, the basic stats. Bird Dog is from Mississauga, Ontario. He played in London Knights in the OHL in the 80s. Uh, he was drafted 22nd overall in 1984 uh, to Philadelphia, but Bird Dog was real tough. Uh, it, it was He was drafted on toughness and his defensive abilities more than anything. He was so tough that you often forget that he was, you know, a big D who covered a lot of ground and got the puck out first and foremost. So he was valuable. He just wasn't a scorer. In today's game, I think he would go uh, unnoticed. Uh, not, not unnoticed. He, his talents wouldn't be as appreciated because he was talented. Uh, but he was crazy. He was a real tough player, and he would intimidate more than anything. He was 6'4", 235. Played 228 games in the NHL with Philadelphia, Quebec, Calgary, Florida, Toronto, and Chicago. And people forget that, you know, even around here, that's a lot of games with a lot of teams. And the minors, he played junior in London, but in the minors he played in Hershey, Halifax, Salt Lake, Long Beach, Los Angeles for the Ice Dogs. Uh, was a team in Los Angeles for a little bit, uh, ended up being Long Beach Ice Dogs. And uh, in St. John's for our beloved Maple Leafs uh, here in town for all those years, Toronto Sperm Team. And... Uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you just one quick one before we call his buddies. Um, and I got some that we re- we recorded a couple weeks ago that we just saved because, uh, well, Mike had the idea at the time. Yeah, we kind of, we during the Teddy episode, we uh, were, a bird dog story came up um, and then it turned into another bird dog story <laughs> and then another one. And then we went, you know what? Uh, we knew that the uh, the anniversary was coming up, and we might want to do something like this. I think it even mentions it in the clip that we're thinking about doing it. And good. Uh, well, you take care of all that. Mike produces this shit, not me. He's uh, <laughs> great at it. I I would be here for weeks just trying to put one together. <laughs> Thanks, uh, buddy. No, it's true, and, and all the graphics and everything outside of the Colby Armstrong one, which I don't know what was happening there. But I, people tended I, to like it. I still stand by it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, people did. So I'm in the minority. But um, to give you one quick bird dog story i guess just he was one of those guys that was always looking out for the team um he was a a lot of things that happened around the room he was dumb like a fox so to speak he always knew what was going on but he didn't really uh let everybody in on it uh 
you know, Bird Dog often acted one way, but he knew exactly what was happening in every other. He was almost like he was in the room. He was a player, but he was a coach. He was a god. He was an idol. He was everything. So I remember, you know, I got to know Bird in the late 90s when I was playing against him, first of all, which was terrifying. And then uh, I got to be his briefly, briefly in St. John's. He was my assistant coach, and we'll get into that in a little bit when I played in 99-2000 for the St. John's Maple Leafs. But after that, you know, he ended up coaching me in, in senior hockey. And we spent the summers together in the shinny and roller hockey, whatever it might be, or fishing, uh, you know, once in a while. Um, we, would, we, we have a group of, you know, maybe 20 or 30 of us that would, you know, we just had traditions, and they were silly. They were drinking traditions in the summer. Bird, first of all, being from Mississauga, he stayed here. And, you know, he just loved it. Bird was a type... I, I, like I said, I don't know if he owned a suit. Uh, I don't mean that in any redneck way. I mean, he was a Newfoundlander type guy through and through. He uh, he liked spending time outdoors. I remember we always used to go to the uh, the senior baseball finals every year. You know, B St. John's and, and Newfoundland being an island, you often get these fans to local sports that don't happen everywhere else uh, in, a, in such numbers. So, you know, a few of us play on the local baseball scene, but at the end of every year, it's, it tends to be St. John's Caps versus Cornerbrook from the West, Cornerbrook Barons. And uh, we all put on our Hawaiian shirts and go down, and Bird would cook all the food. He was always, no one could touch the barbecue. It had to be Bird Dog. And he, that was his, he was in his element, just beers, barbecues, a ball game, and, uh, you know, some good company. And it never really went much further than that with him. That was an ideal day. Uh, you know, he would come down and, and we'd go swimming together and, you know, just just anything to enjoy life. And Bird always had, you know, that we'd bring along the barbecue and the cooler and we had sandwiches and beers wherever we were in the summers. And uh, usually that meant spending time outdoors in Newfoundland. Uh, but, you know, that, that kind of team thing. He's he, Point being here, I'm rambling because he's a good buddy and it's emotional, but uh, after hockey, he continued to be a teammate in many ways, right? Uh, and Bird Dog, the best example of a teammate I can think was when I knew him, when I, when I, in the late 90s, like I said, I was playing against him, but I had all kinds of friends. Todd Gillingham was a good friend then that played for the Maple Leafs, and I knew Sean Thornton and Pepperall and uh, DJ Smith now with the, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And... They had this great story, and Bird never told me himself, but I, I was at the bar, uh, Green Sleeves actually, and we were getting, this is a great cornerstone of George Street, a pub, restaurant, uh, Irish bar, and we were in there getting a steak and some beers, and often, you know, I was their arch rival with Fredericton, and with Fredericton at the time, 98, 99, 2000, myself, Aaron Asham, Darcy Harris, uh, you know, Jerry Fleming, Mark Hussey, David Ling. Boyd Olson, Matt Higgins, we had, we had a group of us that would always hang out. And we, and we were tended to hang out as a team. Back then, it was not as much social media, more and more beers and steaks with the boys afterwards. That's the way it was. Uh, you know, everybody kind of hung out in bars, whether you drank or not. It was part of the culture. And um, so we'd often run into the Leafs and things were on the ice. I mean, I remember fighting Sean Thornton four times one year and, uh, you know, in camp twice and in the regular season. And we were buddies more than anything. We'd, we'd be in the bar and tell stories and cheers. And, you know, it was one of those things. It was a job. But Bird came in and all the boys were just astounded one day. And they said, Bird just turned down a, a call up to Toronto. And I'm like, what? Why would I? I've heard all these stories about him and I experienced him. And it was the end of my second year playing against him at this point. Which means I took a lot of slashes uh, <laughs> and cross checks, almost as and, many as this week. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, almost as many. We we'll get into that after. Um, but uh, Bird turned it down. He he felt. I, I remember Nathan Dempsey was a great defenseman we had here. Uh, there's a great special on Nathan on Sportsnet. You might be able to Google it uh, about six months ago. Uh, he's from Spruce Grove, Alberta, one of the best teammates, best leaders I've ever played with. Uh, and Nathan could have been in the NHL, a lot of people thought, but he was here playing in St. John's. Toronto didn't call him up much. A lot of people thought maybe he could have been up there more. They were losing, and there was defensemen up there that uh, maybe many argued that he did better than he certainly did in St. John's. But he never really got up much. He'd get nine games in. I think it was the curse of the 10-game bonus. I believe it could have been 19. I don't remember. I'm not researching this, but I remember Nathan had some clause in his contract that he got a bonus if he played x number of games i think it stopped at nine for two or three years in, in a row 
in his uh in his line on hockey db um yeah. he's got each season was 14 games in 96 97 he got up he didn't get up again until 99 2000 where he got up for six games 2000 2001 he was there for 25 <laughs> 2001 2002 he was there for three and then he was moved to then he uh, was moved then he uh, ended up on the blackhawks and the whole time he stayed did, up and stayed yeah. up with the blackhawks and the kings for a couple of well years. he did and, and al mcadam was our coach in st john's and al took a job in in chicago and that's quickly sean thornton ended up in chicago and showed it so did nathan dempsey i'm not saying that as much as oh you need a lucky break as much as those guys were going to get it they worked hard but Na- uh, al went over there it was no fluke that the guys on our team, I mean, Sean was one of the toughest in the league and wasn't really getting an opportunity with Toronto at all. Well, 98 99, uh, Sean Thornton put up. Yeah. Just it was sick. I was, I 78 know. games, 354 That was the year minutes. we fought four times. <laughs> yeah. Sake. I know. Yeah. It was scary. And the next year, he was on my line for a lot of the years. So I got some great Thornton stories as well. Um, and, and that was a great foundation looking into all that. I, I would add him on here. We, we'd have to have another bird dog story. He just couldn't make it today. Mm-hmm. He's one of his best friends ever. When he won the Stanley Cup, actually, authority with Anaheim, he gave a shout-out to Bird on TV. But in any case, Bird uh, snapped. He got called up, and anyway, he thought it should have been Nathan Dempsey. So maybe it was the year you said 14, if he played 15. Whatever yeah. it was, it happened two, two or three times to Nathan Dempsey. I remember distinctly that he got fucked on a call-up. So... Um, Anyway, Bird snapped. He, and I, I mean to the point of like throwing a stick around the dressing room and why the fuck would they do that? And, you know, I've been there and I got over 200 games and what do they have against Nathan fucking Dempsey? Like really, really upset. I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody getting called up and not only refusing it, but adamantly recommending someone else that he had no tie to. Other than being his teammate, it's not like Nathan Dempsey was Bird Dog's cousin or he had, he had no other chips in the game, so Jesus. to speak. You know, it was just an admiration of a guy who was a great leader uh, and in, in his estimation should have been in the NHL. So, you know, and, and amongst all that, Bird probably went about that hastily. He probably told someone to go fuck themselves. I, I can just picture it being a caricature of, like I said, he's Paul Bunyan-like. But that's, you know, he would often be rough around the edges getting the point across, but in the end, the point was that, you know, Nathan Dempsey needs to be given a shot. And in the end, Nathan Dempsey did get given a shot mm-hmm. and played in the NHL significantly because he was a good player. Uh, and, and, you know, I can go on and on. The, 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 the story you will hear um, that I told about Bird coming on and threat, <laughs> taking slap shots at our own team. <laughs> you know, when I, I'm playing on an opposing team on the Fredericton Canadians, he's on the St. John's Leaps. And he came on our ice and took slap shots at our players during our practice. I've, I still never heard anything like that. But sure enough, Bird would take the suspension, even though I think even the referees, even the league office were afraid to suspend him. I can't believe he didn't get suspended for that shit. Now it would be a fucking year suspension. You can't even, I mean, you can't even put that in numbers to come on another practice. And take slap shots at the players and hit the coach or the goalie coach. But anyway, you know, but the, but his team rallied and they won those two games. We were up two games and nothing in St. John's. They yeah. came back to Fredericton and after that incident, yeah. right, and all the shit that went on off it and he would take all of it and... You know, he would he would absorb all the heat, and all of a sudden it became about what Bird Dog did, right? And he, he took all the pressure off of the fact that they were down two games of nothing and they yeah. had to win. And so they went out there totally uh, loose, and they won those two games. He was... It, Bird, in many ways, and people might laugh, was a genius. <laughs> and that, at high, at, he knew what he was doing all along. Uh, he, he just often went about it in an... In a, you know, a way that was brute force in some ways, uh, was over the top and was alpha male. But in the end, you know, all he was really trying to do was uh, sacrifice for the team. And, uh, you know, those are two great examples. You know, I guess now we could, we could. Yeah, go. let's, let's actually, uh, let's go back now. We'll, we'll throw on this clip that we recorded a couple of weeks back uh, that started. We were talking about, I guess, Sergey Fedorov. And, we were. And, and then I'd, it rolled into yeah. that bird fought Fedorov. And then we kind of went from there. So yeah. let's take a listen to that. And then we'll come back and we'll get some of uh, Bird's buddies and uh, former teammates uh, on the phone. And we'll, and we'll chat to all of them. So we'll be back in a minute. Bird Dog, I believe Bird Dog, our buddy Greg Smith, I believe Bird Dog's first fight was against Sergey Fedorov. He had a great story. <laughs> Bird passed away last uh, last Love February. Last year, way. yeah. But a uh, great fella, and we can we're and we're going to have Darren Kimball on at some point and talk bird dog stories or or 
Todd Gillingham. Or I think I think we should try to get Theo a couple Fleury of them on. Or, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. A, yeah, he was just a genuine character of the game. Mm-hmm. But Bird loved that story. Fer, Fedorov burned him, and I know what that's like. The first time I went down Bird's side, I got around him and I said, oh, that was easy. And Jer- <laughs> Jerry Fleming looked at me and said, you fucking fool. He's like, <laughs> it was exhibition. He goes, he doesn't give a fuck about that right now. And the fact that you did it and then I like pumped my arm, I didn't really realize who Bird Dog was. I knew he was tough, but I didn't know he was crazy. <laughs> and um, the next time down, sure enough, he broke his stick right over my ankle and I didn't get close to going around him again, nor did I want to. Then you see Bird, they, that's why. Guys like that, I've often said, are important because of just the space they take up on the ice. For most of the times after that, and I was a pretty tough player, but if you want to use that word, but I would look up and if I saw Bird, I'd feather it over his head into the corner and still, it wouldn't look like I was scared because I'd go and, you know, we'd try to make a cycle out of the player, when it, but it, that I far preferred that to trying to get around him wide. And, you know, you didn't know what you were going to get. You might get a cross check in the face. You might end up having to fight. You might, I mean, he was absolutely, he was the bird dog on the ice. One um, of those Ryan Johansson two-handers. But that was his oh. thing. Yeah, well, yeah, no, you know what? That that was bird, though. That was bird. <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, he you just, he'd always say it, too. Like, you won't do that again. You won't do that again until eventually you have nothing left to do. Um, you know, I mean, in front of the net with Bird Dog was absolute torture, 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 torture. Um, but then, you know, I get to know him outside of that. And then you had him as a teammate too. I did. Yeah. Here, right. And, yeah. Uh, and to get, cause I keep going off track, but, uh, whatever. That's what we're here for. Hockey stories. Right? Yeah. Uh, Sergei Fedorov, the second time he did the same fucking thing with Sergei Fedorov. I don't, I have no idea if it's on YouTube. He told me the story and, um, oh, it happened, but apparently he just grabbed him and, and started to, to wail on him. And on the way off, he nearly fought Darren McCarty. He nearly jumped in the bench at Steve Eisenman. <laughs> I believe this is out there somewhere, too. We don't really have the time now to look for it, but yeah. if any fans want to. And uh, even just typing in Greg Smith, S-M-Y-T-H, yeah. Doug, just seeing some highlights. And uh, they're going to be pretty pretty wacky. <laughs> but uh, well, he, he was uh, a great fella. And it's another era. It was another era. And, but there's a really fun thing about Bird Dog that I found out last week. I was going to save because we're talking about maybe doing a Bird Dog we will, yeah. uh, special, which I think we should. And, and it'd be fun to do and get a bunch of people on talking about him. But I found out something really interesting about Bird Dog last week. So in 2000 or sorry, in, in 1992, 1993, which is, you know, one of the most insane years in NHL history, just like so much crazy stuff happened. It was the year Lemieux came back. It was the year Patrick Wall almost lost a starting job in Montreal to go on to win a Con Smythe. Um, you know, all this stuff happens. It's also uh, Gil Stein's last year as, as the president is the last president of the NHL. And he rescinds yeah. the rule because he's trying to break into the U.S. market. So he rescinds the helmet rule. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, so this is it, a great story. They 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 make the rule like uh, in 1979. I think they bring in the helmet rule. All players have to wear helmets. Any players playing in the NHL prior to that are grandfathered in. But in 1992, 93, they 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 rescind the rule because they want the star players yeah. to play without their helmets, so that the American audience they're trying to break into can now recognize, see the stars with you know Amazing. without yeah. without a helmet Amazing. or whatever on. And uh, only two guys take advantage of it. Brett Hall does it in the All Star game. Because he says no one gets hit there anyway. Greg Smith is the only yeah. guy throughout the regular actually season played. who does it. Wow. So other than other he than McTavish, did, he's the, the only 90s. guy. Wow. He's the only guy after 1970 who started playing after 1979 who to play without a helmet. Opted. Opted out in the, the 90s. <laughs> like we're almost at the point now where like but visors. There's shots. You know, yeah, there's shots. Yeah. Coming. Like, you know, they, they, that was no different than now. Like, you know, the shots are coming a bit harder, but there was. I mean, look, Al McInnes and Chris Pine. Yeah, I was going to, the, yeah. the first like, fellow I thought, imagine well, taking well, an Al McInnes yes, off well, the also, dome then. But also, isn't, like, they're both, he's he's in, um, he's playing in Calgary with McInnes, isn't he? Yeah, like well. Like in 92, okay. 93, isn't McInnes still there? Maybe he so was he's, there at that time. Yeah, I know that, you know, and all the guys that played with Bird, Bird's got scattered games with, like, Florida, Toronto, Quebec, Philly. Calgary, I mean, at least those teams. So it's a hockey DB 90, game 90, 90, 92, games. 93, McInnes is on the Flames. It's the same year Bird Dog's on the Flames Imagine. doing this. So, so this is, he's playing 82 games with Al McInnes. Yeah. And with Al McInnes so behind him. So Al shot yeah. is somewhere. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Al McInnes' shot is happening no in that bucket. game. And, and, and Bird Dog <laughs> opts out of wearing a bucket. Like... Come on, man. McInnes, yeah. McInnes played 50 games that year. Uh, and and Bird Dog played without a helmet for a bunch of them. But that's the choice. kind of guy. That's the mentality, man. Like, he was just uh, all out. And I'm sure some of it with Bird was for a story, too. He probably would never say it, but that was Bird, man. Anything for the boys. Anything for a story. I remember they uh, they made him in Philly. 
he should have written a book. It would have been better than mine. Um, <laughs> and I mean that. People think I got stories. Man, holy fuck. So he's in Philly. That's one for the back jacket of the new one. Is, they, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Greg, don't Greg, buy this. Get bird dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Greg Smith would have written a better book. I'm, Terry Ryan. <laughs> I'm confident people like, you know, enjoy my book, plural soon. But um, it's just... It's just next level. I tell a story and then Bird Dog would and like it would be one of those everybody's silent kind of thing. Like, did that really fucking happen? <laughs> but he tells me a story in Philly um, and the boys made him, so there was a toll, so they made him pick up the veterans. Um, and for whatever reason, like I, I guess they made him go like 45 minutes out of the way to pick up a few of the veterans. I don't know, let's say yeah. Dan Cordick and a couple more. Yeah. I can't remember who. I believe he was there though. Um, so, and they're, and they, and they, and they got to go over the bridge and, and go to the rink. They're paying the tolls or whatever. So Bird shows up to get, I don't know, say Cordic. It's probably not him. I can figure this out later. But anyway, it's three of the flyers. And um, But he's Bird goes out that morning and, and buys a convertible. This is like February in Philadelphia. <laughs> and because uh, he's called up, whatever it is, and um, buys a convertible. And then he goes to pick up the boys with no money either. So he's there, and they're like, what the fuck is this? He's like, hey, you wanted me to pick you up? Here it is. And the fucking roof's broken. So he put he takes down the top. They're driving around Philly now. He's got everything. So it's a he, theme. Bird dog. Yeah, yeah. He's got off. like yeah. layers, right? Yeah. And the boys are just freezing. They're hunched over. And then anyway, he made them pay for the tolls. And they told him actually, uh, Bobby Clark, I believe, told him, that don't worry about the tolls here. Just say you're with the flyers. So that was the other part of it. He said he picked up the boys. Try to get him back. And that was it about the toll. So he pulls up. He says, yeah, I'm with the Flyers. And the guy's like, I don't give a fuck. You owe me $1.75 for the bridge. <laughs> but, but anyway, so that was it. So if you wanted a ride from Bird Dog for the rest of it, he'd pick you up with his convertible down. So anyway, he just ended up fucking off on his own. And no one asked him for a ride anymore. That's the way and to do it, though. That's the kick. way to get out of the he ride. He such a kick out of that. Show anyway. up in February with the top down and, well, no, and no change he, for the tolls. You know, it's imagine brilliant. who you're dealing with. So yeah. A, he's willing to do that. They've already seen him up for no bucket. <laughs> yeah. I mean, by the time I played against him, it was in the late nineties in St. Uh, I was playing for Fredericton. He was playing for St. John's and, uh, Oh God, I'll, t- I'll just tell this one quick story. But, uh, the best of all that time was in the playoffs. We were playing them and all the Canadian teams had been knocked out of the NHL playoffs. So it was Leafs versus Canadians with the old school jerseys. It wasn't like the Hamilton Bulldog Canadians. It was, the Fredericton Canadians, we had their jerseys. St. John's Maple Leafs had the Leafs jerseys, so it had that feel to it. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of press surrounding it because we were, you know, the, the Habs and the Leafs weren't in the playoffs. So anyway, we're, we we um, came into St. John's and we're up two games of nothing. It's a three out of five the first round, and we're up two games of nothing. So we go back to Freddy. <coughs> and we, we have practice, and all the brass are there. So, like... Jacques Lemaire was with us then. Uh, Roly Melanson was the goalie coach. Mario Tremblay, Pierre Mondou, all Stanley Cup winners. Uh, Reggie Hull, Rajon Hull. So they all came down to Fredericton. So we go out, and at that yeah that year was my first in the American League, and I had a decent year. I had twenty one goals, I believe, uh, to 30, 30 odd fights, uh, which which was important then. I was playing with Dave Ling, I think, on the line, but but anyway. So we, we went out for our optional pregame skate, which came off early because we figured we'd be playing that night. That's how it works. And the Black Aces stay on and they get skated. And, um, you know, and at that time, our Black Aces, actually, Mike Ribeiro was one of them. Uh, Eric <laughs> Schwinard. Yeah, because they were called up from junior. So, yeah, in another world, we dressed and he didn't. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So just, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's amusing enough. But, um so anyway, we, we go out to, to practice, and I come off. Now, Dave Morissette, who I've talked about before, is being one of the toughest guys I've ever seen. And in the last NHL game I played, I fought Cam Russell. Well, he fought Bob Probert, and Gabe Probert, according to Bob Probert, even in his book, the toughest punch he's ever taken. So Moose comes off, and Moose is even scared. He comes in the room. He's like, Terry, Bird Dog is going crazy. He's going crazy. I'm like, what can Bird Dog be doing Like to go crazy? We have practice. What do you mean? What's he yelling at you from the stands? I go out. Bird Dog is on our ice. Again, this is the Montreal Canadiens. All the scouts are there skating the young guys. And our three goalies are Jose Theodore, Matthew Garon, and Thomas Vokun. They're three future All-Stars. So one of them, I can't remember which one, was out there taking shots. I believe it was Vokun, though. Um, So they're out there, and we go out, and Bird is skating around our ice, and he's got pucks, and he's slapping them at whoever. So as I'm looking, we come up. Puck comes, whoop, wires right by my head and hits the visitor's sign or the home sign behind the bench. 
So myself, Boyd Olson, Matt Higgins, Alan Nazardine, I'll never forget it. It's right in my head photographically. We jump down. It's all of a sudden like we're in a trench in the war or something. Not to downplay what the soldiers do, because it's not, but just the setting of it <laughs> seemed like that. So Bird is there taking fucking shots. I mean, slappers at the band. I'm seeing boom, boom, boom. And they're coming in, and I'm going, what in the fuck is going on right now? And I peek my head up for a second, and I can hear where he's going, so the pucks aren't coming at the bench anymore. We peek up over it, just see our eyes. And he takes one at Roly Melanson, our goalie coach. Again, he's out there. He's our goalie coach. He jumps out of the way and it hits his stick. And Roly's stick just goes flying into the corner and the puck goes up, nearly hits him in the head. And we're like, what in the fuck? Bird Dog <laughs> looks over. He says, get the fuck off the ice. You were supposed to be off at 10.15. And we're going, what? Is he like pulling rank on us for like, I don't know. Because they weren't on until like 11.30. But we had time for our prospects. But anyway, not, not only does Bird say this. We listen. I, I wasn't going out there. I looked at Michelle Terry was our coach. I said, well, I'm certainly not. We're playing the night. I'm, it's hard enough to deal with him in an official game on ice, but at least I'll get five minutes for fighting. At least it's on record. I'm not going out there now against Bird Dog, pissed off, skating around. So I said, like, I don't know what to do. And Moose said, well, I'm not doing it. Moose was, Moose was our toughest player. So no one did. So we just got the fuck off. We just got off the ice. Jacques Lemaire, Roly Milan, all of them. Fold it. No, the Black Aces don't need to work. Thomas, you don't need any work. Let's just come in. And we got the fuck off. And sure enough, Bird Dog, Sean Thornton, Adam Mayer, and the rest of the St. John's Maple Leafs came on and practiced early in our own burn. I've never heard of that happening. You think you got home wow. ice advantage until Greg Smith plays against you. That's beautiful. Yeah. And then, and, that's and then, like how my long? Tenth how, Doug story. And how long after that is it that you're on his team in Toronto or in, in St. John's? In St. John's, I was uh, so I played the next season with Freddie as well, and then the season after that in St. John's. And and on his team, did you? Did he? He ended up being our assistant coach, but he got uh, he left of his own volition. I won't say fired, but um, this really happened. Jason Bonsignor uh, was on our team. If any of the boys, uh, DJ Smith was there, assistant coach of Toronto now. If anybody's listening to this, they're immediately perking up because I don't know if it's ever been talked about publicly. But why not? Bird's uh, Bird's not with us anymore, but he is with us kind of thing. So, And he would want me to say this. <laughs> We're in Portland playing against the Portland Pirates, and uh, Bonsignor was known as a bit of uh, – he was fifth, sixth overall. I, I think he went – Edmonton had two picks in the first round in 94. They picked him with one and Ryan Smith with the other. And he was the kind of guy, he, he comparisons to Mario Lemieux. He was big like Mario Lemieux. He shot right. He had the same bucket. He wore that, whatever it was, the coho, whatever it was. It's Jofa, wasn't it? Um, no, no he started Jofa. with the Cooper, I think, and then yeah. moved into the Jofa. Oh, Joho. yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. was the Kelly Bookburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, but even then, no one was wearing that. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was long gone in, in 2000, but yeah. that's when Bonsignor. So, but Bonsignor had a bit of cockiness to him. Um, again, the kind of guy that you could probably get along with if you were out having dinner, but it didn't work for a team. He, he would come in and it was, it was just, he was programmed uh, selfishly. I, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, I, I, yeah. So w- without cutting him up too much, cause I don't want to, I mean, hockey's hockey and he's moved on with his life, but that's the way he was. So him and David Nymarovsky hung out together and Nemo was a pretty good guy and nothing wrong with him. But Bird Dog didn't like them very much and they lipped off a bit. So they, we were at dinner and, you know, you often rib guys, you know, you know, what the fuck are you going to do? How did you go eighth overall? What are you, you know, you, you robbed the bank, noof, whatever. And that shit's normal. I get it, right? So you're just having a good time. But Bonsignor, and they, we, we'd all had a few beers. And sometimes, if someone doesn't like it, and to me, I would never, ever start that cutting up little mm-hmm. razzing game with Bird Dog of all people. Yeah. I just wouldn't do it. I don't care what he says to me. Uh, but anyway, Bonsignor came back, and I'll never forget the exact words were, um, well, when I'm 30 or 31, whatever he said, at least I won't be the assistant coach of some fucking AHL team. Uh, I'll be in the NHL. And with that, Bird Dog flipped over the table. We were at a nice steakhouse. He flipped over the table with his hands, and he grabbed Bonsignor, and he threw him on the ground. And he had him by the, by the cuff of his, and he said, if you ever say that to me, it'll be the last thing you fucking say, you pansy. I'll never forget it, okay? And that kind of... I don't know. It didn't sound great. I don't know if he got fired because I think he left of his own volition. Bird didn't. Bird figured, and most of the guys on that team, Ryan Epperall, myself, DJ Smith, Sean Thornton, Kevin Adams, Nathan Dempsey were team guys. But I, and I think I don't think he ever expected to hear that. 
and he flipped out. And for us, I got to be honest, we kind of liked it. Because mm-hmm. uh, if there's a guy sometimes getting cut, no one got, there wasn't a punch thrown. Yeah. But I mean, he flipped the fucking table over. Jeez. <laughs> like this was, this, I, mean, I still haven't seen anything quite like that. But again, that's exactly what I expect Bird Dog to do. And he put him in his fucking spot. But after that, I believe Bonsignor either ended up uh, leaving or, or, you know, he got his walking papers one way or the other because it was like his third chance at that time. Uh, but Bird Dog ended up, you know what he did, boys? He started that year. He left the Maple Leafs, um, and he started to be involved in senior hockey. And that was the golden age of senior hockey in Newfoundland. We're still got a pretty high level. I mean, like I said, we won the Allen Cup a couple of years ago. But back then, you know, guys were getting five, six hundred a game. And Bird Dog, you know what he did? He didn't play for cash. He played for moose meat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm serious. He played for moose meat, fish, and beers. And I, I mean, again, it, it, it gets bigger. He's like Paul Bunyan or Davy Crockett. These stories keep growing. But that's what he did. And then he got a job at the golf course. He had some good uh, real estate investments. Uh, so Bird didn't need a really complicated or expensive life. It didn't take much to uh, to satisfy him, you know. So and um, he's. Uh, Getting a bit emotional even talking about him. But, you, you know, so I, I don't want to paint a picture of this madman that there's a lot of us that w- what he did that night in Portland was kind of necessary mm-hmm. um, in, in a lot of ways. He went over the top with it, but just like he was on the ice, man, he was fucking mad. And, you know, he was there for that reason. And I still think, you know, what did we do? Bonsignor ended up shutting up. He never said anything like that again. He was shortly gone, and Nemirovsky really picked up his game, and we did better from that point on. So there's always... <laughs> But again, I don't think he, he outright got fired. I think Bird was like, you know what? Um, I, I don't need to be involved in this. He loved St. John's, first of all. He loved it. Yeah, game. he He's stayed from, here from there. From Mississauga. He's yeah. from Toronto. Like I said, he moved here. I don't know of many other players to do it because he wanted to. And you see Bird Dog out around. He's in rubber boots, mm. right? But Bird Dog <laughs> never owned a suit, I don't think, after the NHL. Like, I never saw him in one. He mm. coached me in senior hockey. Uh, but, you know, he was just one of the – he loved life. And, and I really don't think that Bird needed to be involved in hockey after that. After that, you know, he just loved being around the rink. He always coached. He was always doing a senior team or, or a junior team. Uh, but not necessarily making money at it. I don't think he needed to. Bird was simple, simple guy. And – you know, because of all that, you know, Sean Thornton will tell you it's his favorite player ever. But, uh, you know, though, there's two bird dog stories. Yeah. And, boys, they sound fucking crazy, don't they? They, they would it. land in the top right. five. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, uh, and, but here, here's something that I feel is important to uh, point out after that story is that at age 31, Jason Bonsignor was playing for the Fresno Falcons in the ECHL. Nothing against Jason Bonsignor, but I'm glad of those sides. I took birds all those years ago because uh, we became great friends right up until the moment he passed away. And I do feel like he's always with me. He was uh, one of the most giving people I've ever met. All right. Um, I can't stop yeah. thinking about uh, that pregame skate story. I mean, like, I just, I, I'm just, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just That's picturing. Book, right? That one's in your book? Yeah, that is actually in yeah. my book. I got another couple coming for the next. You could do, you know what? Maybe, guys, it'll be me to do a bird dog book one day. Yeah. I've, I've got right. that many. Yeah. Um, there's just crazy shit. Breakaway on Tim Shovel Day. He flipped it up so Shovel Day would catch it. Cross checked him right. The neck came off right <laughs> into the boards. There you go. On a breakaway. <laughs> This interview brought to you by Little Dog. Five years after quitting a match, Tommy Little Dog Ross begins a quest for redemption. Little Dog Season 2 is on CBC Now. Catch it Thursday nights at 9 Eastern, 9.30 in Newfoundland. By the way, keep an eye out for yours truly taking a few knocks in the ring. That's Thursday nights at 9 Eastern, 9.30 in Newfoundland. Little Dog Season 2. Okay. First, uh, guys, our first guest here is uh, a good friend of mine. Name is Tommy Beckett and a great friend of Bird Dog, one of his best buddies. And to give you, uh, to preface this a little bit, just to give you an idea of who Tommy is and and, uh, and how we roll here in St. John's. Bird Dog, like I said, is from Miss- Mississauga, and he moved to St. John's. And there's probably a group of twenty or thirty of us that have hung out ever since he moved here, which would have been, you know, twenty years ago. Yeah, it was ninety six, ninety seven. Uh, I think was his when first he first season. came here. Yeah. yeah, and he's been, you know, his his life partner tammy tilly they they were together pretty much since day one and you know in the summers you know his buddy todd gillingham played on the leaps then bird bird dog played on the saint john's maple leaps here and then just stayed here so you know tommy beckett played uh, who we're talking to now played in the maritime junior league right tommy with who absolutely yeah 
Who did you play with in the Maritime Junior? Oh, I'm sorry. With the, with the, with the Halifax Mooseheads. Well, okay, with the Mooseheads before, uh, yeah, before yep. they were the uh, Quebec Major Junior franchise, and then, you know, we have a yep. thriving St. Yep. John's uh, or Newfoundland Senior League. Tommy played in a few teams there, and in the summers, Bird Dog and we would all play roller hockey or ball hockey, whatever it would be, to stay in shape. And we'd also hang out, and we had a wine shirt day, and we would drink, and we would, you know, always have fun and find ourselves downtown at maybe the Green Sleeves or the Allen Lager. But Bird Dog, and you know, it became a um, an atmosphere that we were all kind of together all the time kind of thing and Tommy Absolutely. was probably you know Tommy you were probably the most common denominator in there you know with uh, Bird I mean really I mean you, you kind of I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing well it was a good thing for me it was a glue I would often Absolutely. you know Bird didn't have a cell phone for the majority of the time people like he was like Bill Murray no. trying to get a hold of the fucking guy so you know I often yeah. you know even though I love Bird Dog you know, I'm not an East Ender like you fellas. I live in Mount Pearl. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, I would often come across Bird being with yourself. Uh, and some of that time, Tommy, was in the great times we had in the 2000s, playing roller hockey in the summer. Now, you can explain. Yeah. I suppose, uh, you know, we had a league here and everybody wanted to play. We took it really serious. And anyway, that's go right. ahead. We did, absolutely. Tell a story yeah. or two from those so, days. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we had a team. I know, Terry, you had your team there with Mount Pearl and we had our team. Uh, I guess it was kind of a maybe an east-west uh, uh, coast uh, yeah. uh, rivalry, but uh, we had uh, a good group with our team. We had the Trinity Pub as our sponsor, of course, which is a very well uh, local pub, well-known. Yeah, one of our favorite I wanna say water first, actually, I, wanna, I just want to say first that I'm coming from, uh, I'm coming live today from Kelly's Pub, which was basically, uh, you could call it Birdhouse as well, too. I mean, the guy <laughs> spent every Saturday here, so I'm here now having a Budweiser and eating some chicken wings at Kelly's. I don't think you can get any more bird dog than that. To be quite honest. With a few of the boys out here. With a few of his good buddies. Yeah, so we've got, I've got, I've probably got a couple, of, yeah, a few of the teammates there from this, uh, from the Trinity Pub team. The legacy. So anyway, we had, uh, yeah, we had Mike Manning's there and uh, Jeremy Hart. And uh, we got actually Greaser Todd Baldwin's here from Gander as well, too. We just popped in for a beer. And uh, the legend, the man himself, Anthony Ballas, Vinny Vegas, is here as well, too. So a few of us are getting together. Actually, Bird Dog's brother, I'll get back to the story in a second, but Bird Dog's brother oh, this is just called me from Toronto. He called the bar. I walked into Kelly's. And the girl behind the bar is asking for me already. I'm like, Jesus, my wife just dropped me off. It can't be, it can't be here already. <laughs> um, so anyway, Maddie called down. Maddie called down and wanted to set up a tab for us so we could have a few beers on, on the, on the uh, Smith family this afternoon, which I thought was a great thing. Bird's got a great family too. So I mean, I'm sure Terry can touch a little bit more on that later. But uh, anyway, so Maddie set up a little tab for us. Fantastic. A couple of Budweiser's on him. It was great, yeah. Just a great close-knit family, all his brothers up there. I can just imagine what, well, uh, and, and what, what uh, morning. But Tommy, what people don't realize as well, I keep forgetting is because it's so bird dog, but we didn't even really have a, a funeral in the way of a regular funeral. Like where you were, Tommy, no. right now, for those who are listening, you know, he, as you said, he's at Kelly's Pub, which is on George Street, which is where the Trinity yes. Pub is and the Allen Lager and Green Sleeves. And we right. all hung out with all the boys. And Mike Manning there now is actually the owner of Trinity Pub, one of them. And he's Absolutely. with with Tommy. Yeah. But they would all, you know, yeah. on Saturday, Bird loved to go to Kelly's and he loved to have his, you know, wings and his beers. So on his yeah. funeral, instead of... Uh, you know, having a big, uh, you know, traditional kind of funeral. Bird requested it on that on Friday. Everybody dropped down and even had some, uh, yeah. you know, a, a, there was a tab there from his yeah. family. So you can yeah. explain that before you get into your story, I guess, uh, Tommy. So that was a year yeah. ago. I couldn't be there. I was on the road in the UK, but anyway. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were gone, yeah. But we, we knew you felt this for sure. But yeah, we, he wanted to just have a, we had a couple of days up at the funeral home, of course, uh, just for some people who uh, probably wouldn't, you know, want to be down for that party atmosphere. You can't even believe how many, uh, people this guy touched it was incredible i mean there was guys you know you had people showing up who maybe spoke to bird for 15 minutes at a rink one time <laughs> yeah, and they just, yeah, he just had that impact you know what i mean there's a couple of guys like i mean most people walked in through the door i knew them of course but for the most part you're just sitting like who's this guy who's that and then once they told you who they were you're like really you know i mean it was incredible so then we of course at the end of the week we had a we had a um a, a party down here at kelly's and it was changed shoulder to shoulder from three o'clock on the place never stopped we actually, Bird and uh, Tammy and, and a couple times I did as well, too, we'd always jump on the Metro bus for a laugh and come down even instead of getting a taxi. Might be a little bit of fact, too, Bird was a bit of a penny pincher, but we get into that as well, too. <laughs> but anyway, he'd take the bus, we'd take the Metro bus down. So the day of the Bird's party, that's just great. Uh, Tammy hired a Metro bus. Oh, that's he picked, great. Uh, a bunch of us up in the East End and came down, and he had written on the top of the bus, uh, the Bird Dog Express, and uh, everyone jumped on. The, bird, the two buses were full, and everyone uh, had a few beers on the way down and stuff it was just a it was a, fa a great way to send off a great guy you know what i mean it's just but he didn't want that traditional 
he was a very, uh, you know, untraditional type guy. He liked to do things a certain way, and that's what he requested to do, and Tammy was good enough to do that for him. And I think we had a fantastic night here, just tears, music. There was a few tears, and lots of people got up. Corey Power did a absolutely incredible tribute to him. It was just, you know, funny but heartfelt, and uh, everybody in the room, you know, I, could, I had to sit down. I was actually getting overheated. I was uh, I was so choked up by it. It was, it was a very, very great tribute, and... Uh, it was just an incredible night, I got to say, and it was a great send off for sure. <clears throat> oh, that's fantastic! But to, uh, I guess to, uh, yes, like you said, Mike Manning is here to segue back into the, I guess, try and find a roller hockey. Well, all you guys there now, for like, those listening, all the boys there now are ex hockey players that during that time we right. played in that roller hockey league. I had Teddy Purcell yeah. on here a few episodes ago and yep. he explained it i mean it was roller hockey but we took it serious because it was all the best hockey we players took it serious. yeah we really yep. did like we had an all newfoundland which you know is a provincial championship and we you yep. know it was over the course of a weekend or two and you know you'd you'd get together and play and and you know yep. at, at, at at night you'd get together for a few beers but it was very serious i mean uh, yeah it was uh, you know yeah, and it was some good players like chloe, chloe played there for a year teddy purcell yourself and i mean all the other guys I mean, it was a good fast Scotty Sullivan. I mean, there was a lot of good guys in that league who could really handle themselves. And it was it was just like, uh, it was a great league. And it took a few years kind of to get it going. But by the time we did, it was it was just near the end of it. Holy moly. It was flying. And I can remember some of those nights up there. You had to have, uh, you know, everyone stuck around a dressing room after because it took you about two and a half hours to stop sweating. Because it was, we had some problems with uh, ventilation. <laughs> well, oh my God. It was very, very oh, warm. I mean, you know. Yeah, and there yeah. was, but you know, those were some of the best times. Now, Bird Dog, you know, uh, I, I would bring my stereo. Uh, I was one for the tunes, right. and Bird was one for the uh, the barbecue and the beers. So we okay. would often, I yeah. often tell people that those those if we had a game at two or three in the afternoon, that would spill over into the dressing room for two or three hours, and then we'd all go downtown, and we'd all end up somewhere. Um, but Bird Dog, I mean, some of those. Some of those nights. I mean, Tommy, do you remember when he showed up in Middle Cove with the snorkel gear? I thought he was oh, kidding. Absolutely. He loved it. <laughs> he, he loved it. He was just, he, he was, his, 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 you know, for a guy who came from Ontario, his love for the ocean was absolutely, we went, uh, and me and, and me and Bert and, and Tammy and Dana, my wife, we went to, uh, a friend of mine owns a house down in Daniel's Cove. I'm from Old Burlington, my parents are, and it's like a little bit further. There's probably six houses down there. And he's got a place renovated, and he gave it to us for the weekend. And I don't know if you've ever seen that picture that I took of Bird on the beach. Uh, I did. The black and white one that I had done. I took that myself. Uh, I just happened to catch him. You know, he's got the stick in his hand and the beer in another hand, sitting with the ocean behind him. He loved the ocean. He loved getting in the ocean. If there was anywhere there was water, Bird was in it. Like, I mean, the nickname Bird Dog, I'm sure it didn't stem, you know, from actual being like a, a beagle or a water dog. But the guy was just... He'd go in and he'd come back with a flounder or something on the end of the stick. Like he was just he and was just fucking this freezing. Human. You know, those listening yeah. worldwide here, because you know, are, it, this gets national yeah. and international. You know, there's always uh, listeners from all over the world. Like our our yeah. water is freezing. It's not even. It's not like if you're in Florida, oh, and you yeah, just go yeah, for a dip. We're not talking. Yeah, no, it's, it's not like a not like a seven star resort in Cuba when you hit that water down there. No, no, you're numb. It's hypothermia. But Bird would yeah. get in there with a snorkel. I mean, technically, you can oh, yeah. see fish, and if you're willing to go under the water. I mean, I'm from here. I go to the beach a lot. <laughs> I do not swim yeah. a lot. But uh, no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> but he would. Yeah. Um, and uh, you yeah. know, over the course of those years, Tommy, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, and I wasn't in on every story, but I yeah. mean, what would be? I hate to say your favorite, but what would be your f- yeah. One of your favorite bird dog memories. I think, well, just to, to branch it out, and I'm sure Corey Power is going to be listening at some point. Corey and Power also were, uh, Corey and, and bird dog were, and Corey was a great hockey player himself, fast, he great hands, and a uh, tough kid too. Tough as nuts. Me and him had a little scrap one night in Mount Pearl. <laughs> oh, nice. But anyway, we're best of buds now. <laughs> so anyway. I didn't realize uh, that. We'll get were, into that were, on another pod. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, they were best of buds back in the day and still are, of course. I mean, you know. So. Uh, but Corey always had an edge to try and get at Bird. They were everything he could possibly do just to get Bird going because he loved to get him going. Of course, once Bird got going, look out! You know what I mean? He just unleashed, and it was just just a fucking gong show, and it was hilarious. So anyway, one of my favorite stories is we were playing in the roller hockey league to get back to the roller, and of course uh, it was just a regular league game at this point. But Bird had come around the net, and Corey was very fast. Of course, and he was cutting cutting up to the middle. Bird fires him up a big pass, and it kind of got caught up in his skates a little bit. Anyway, he missed the pass and game went on. 
So we knew, everyone knew, we got in the dressing room after and Power just starts. He just goes in that bird and it's like, geez, you think a guy who played in the show be able to feed something tape to tape and he's going on and on. And I'm two styles away from Bird. I'm just kind of cornering my eye going, this is heading somewhere. There's no <laughs> doubt about this. I can, I can guarantee. He's just he's just smoldering there now, taking it all in and letting Power have his moment and blah, blah, blah. That's the way he was. So Corey keeps it up and then finally I just look and Bird Dog raises his head. He goes, Power. I used to play with a guy. I don't know if you ever heard of him before. His name is Guy Lafleur. He told me you can't make a bad pass to a good player. Now shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and the entire dressing room just collapsed. Everyone burst out laughing. It was the best comeback I think I've ever heard in my life. Oh, that's right? true. That's true too. You put it two <laughs> feet behind Lafleur, and he's going to turn it into a goal. <laughs> but yeah, that's right. Yeah. I love how it Bird so come funny. back like that. Yeah, he was just stewing yeah. too. You could figure he's either going to fucking go crazy and slam the stick yeah. over the wall or or he's gonna have a great yeah, one liner. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he always had a couple. I mean I got that uh I got a poster done up for his parties or whatever with all of his cliche sayings on it. I still have it. I have I built a bar in my house and I'll carry Hey you've got a I great a uh, and that's another yeah, side note thing. Yeah I'm a huge tragic for hip fan so I built a bar in my basement. It's called the Golden Ray Motor Inn which comes from the song the lyrics from the luxury and uh, I have pretty much one half of it is all tragically hip stuff and stuff I've collected. But the other half now, I kind of have all my hockey buddies. I got Terry's book there, and I've got say, he's going to give me an eight by ten to do other things. I got as many autograph things as I can. I, I just created a leaf wall now because I have a lot of Hab fans that come over too. So I like to make them sit in that section. <laughs> and anyway, I've got, I've got I've got bird dogs. I've got bird dogs right up front there on the wall, and and uh, so I mean it, it's just. Uh, you know, I just love to go down. I was down this morning. I got a little tribute to him in one of my windows in the basement there. And I went down this morning. I made him some steak and eggs. And I went down and sat with him for an hour and had a chat like I always do. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was just a great moment to watch a bit of sports desk and sit by his picture and, and have some uh, steak and eggs in my bar. You know what's funny, Tommy, is that I've had a lot of friends... You know, the older we get, this happens, right? You, you have friends I, at an early Absolutely. age. I had a few roommates that, that passed away. Yep. And, and once in a while, I, I don't even know if I'm religious in the conventional sense. I like to believe that, you know, consciousness goes somewhere and, and our energy goes somewhere. Right. And, and But it's Absolutely. funny that with Bird Dog, um, even though, you know, it's funny, I never played on his team in pro. I came across him so much. And in the summers back here, we right. would have a great time. And he coached me in Mount Pearl and yep. Senior. But, you know, there are people that I was really, really close with um, that I never really thought to do that. But I've often, yeah, just like you said, like had a meal sense or if I'm having wings and a beer and the Stanley Cup finals on, I will break out Bird's pitcher and I feel like he's with me. And I do. Yeah. It's almost therapeutic, but there's something yeah, about is, Bird. Man. There was something about him that felt immortal. And I don't feel yeah. like it's a waste of time when I'm doing it. I don't. It, it's good for me, but I feel that. I mean, who knows? The, the, the point being, I, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but I've never really had that urge to do that with other people. Bird, Bird was yeah. such a shoulder to lean on, and yeah, it was. He's huge. You know, he was yeah, me so many times that you yeah. feel like he's still I, here. I feel as we're doing, as yeah. we're talking now. But yeah. yeah, I still go. Listen, I still go down. If anybody ever drove by his house, I go down every now and then and mow his lawn and stuff for him, which I promised I would always do because you know how particular he was about his barbecue and his, and his lawn, and his fire pit, and all that. So I still go down now, you know, every couple of weeks when I'm always on. And it gives me a chance, honestly, just to walk around and I have a chat with him while I'm doing it. If anybody ever walked by there, you know, who is this lunatic out mowing his lawn? Yeah, having to wait to himself. But, you know, it just gives me a few minutes to, to you know, and I, I just have a little chat with him. I tell him how things are going. And, you know, it's just it's just a presence who's always around me. I feel that. There's, there's no doubt about it. He was that, you know, the guy, don't forget the guy's six foot five. So no matter where he was in the room. He was always around you, you know what I mean? So he was just <laughs> he a big, was. he was a big, you know what I mean? He was a big teddy bear for me. There's no doubt. Like I spent a lot of good times with him and everybody knows what he could do on the ice, but off the ice, you couldn't find a, a finer gentleman. I mean, I, I remember the very first time and my wife still says this, that she came down the stairs when Bird's father and his brothers and stuff were there. As soon as she came down, I went to introduce her. They all stood up. You don't see that very often. They stood up because, you know, a woman walked in the room. And, you know, she says that after she says, that's just the kind of family that he was raised in, a respectful family. And, you know, she knew it right from the minute she met his family. Well, and you, uh, you right. spent some time with the family as well, didn't you? I mean, I remember. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Many, yeah, I talked many to a summer. This morning, actually. Yeah. I see. Many a summer. Yeah. 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 And it's they all, just... I remember they, they all drove down on a bus one time, on one of those uh, Winnebago's. The whole oh, crew. Crazy. And listen, you know, Bird, is, Bird was off his, off his rocker, there's no doubt. Don't forget, he got it from someone. He's got older brothers and stuff too. These guys are just 
they came down, they showed up with a washer's kit. You want to see a couple of guys play washers? I think me, me and Vinny probably lost 100 bucks each that day. They just didn't miss. They were, um, opening, they were opening beers and not even looking and can you, them in the hall. I, I don't know if you remember this, Tommy, but and I don't know why I was in the building. I must have been injured, but uh, Hamilton... Um, Hamilton, what was the name of their team? The uh, Bulldogs, back in the yeah. late nineties, were playing the Maple Leafs. Remember, and Cleary was there, and he had a cheering section from Harbor Grace. Right. And Bird Dog's family was up in the bar, and you know, I guess Cleary made a good move on Bird Dog or something. And you know, the fans, what are they going to do? They're going to cheer their hometown guy. But the boys came yeah. down then, like, like, like paid help. They they were dressed in all black, and they came out of the bar and they sat in that area. And everybody in Cleary's section shut up. And I remember Bird Dog getting a penalty, you know, like he would. Uh, he, yeah. he wasn't wasn't lost on too many players playing against Bird not to go down his side twice. And the second one, he gave Cleary yeah. a chop. If you play with Bird, you knew that yeah. you're going to give him two to four penalty minutes a game just because he had to do that chop. And it, it would benefit you in the end because, you know, people weren't going to go down that side as much and they probably weren't going to get oh, as many right. scoring chances. But uh, I, yeah, I, I remember... He'd give it the outside, but you <laughs> wouldn't take it twice. That's yeah, hard. he'd give it to you knowing yeah. that he was going to hurt you. Give him a, give him a chance to yeah. uh, whack... You'd, the- you'd, you'd, pay, you'd pay the tolls and go to the left. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, speaking of tolls, though, speaking of tolls, Terry was telling us uh, in, in the clip that we had earlier. Terry told us a story about Bird when he was with the Flyers, um, and Do you he, yeah, and he was saying that you knew more of that story, something about picking up some guys in a convertible in, you, in the dead of winter in Philadelphia. Do you remember that uh, uh, Beckett, or was that Gilly? I'm not telling sure if I remember me? that one. He well, he, the gist of it is that the, one? the boys played a trick on him, and, and, and they told him when he when he went up to the tolls. Tolls, toll booths, tolls sounds so fucked up. Uh, toll booths yeah. in Philadelphia, you know, just say you're with the Flyers and they'll let you in. So he says, yeah, I'm with the fucking <laughs> Flyers. But then, you know, so, you know, the guy says, I don't give a shit who you are. You still owe it a buck 75. So then he went out and bought a convertible. And so the guys that he had to pick up every day that fucked him over with that uh, joke, I guess, fucked him over. Yeah. Um, he just went and he drove to practice in February, the rest of February, in a convertible. But I, I remember Gilly telling me that, and I know there's more to it. So I'll wait, yeah. and, and maybe I was trying to get a hold of Gilly. That might have, yeah, that might have been I'm, Gilly. I'm sure I don't know that one. Kimball and, and Fleury I, might know that one as well, and they're yet to come out. I didn't see the thing about Bird early. Like, I only really got a lot of his. He, only, he, didn't, he didn't talk about it much. No, like, other people did. He never yeah. wanted to be the guy in the room, you know what I mean? Like, he didn't. He, you know, I, I'd be with him sometimes out in the backyard having a beer by the fire, and Brendan Shanahan would phone. I'd be like, oh, I'd be like, yeah. oh, yeah, Shanahan. You know what I mean? Or, or, uh, or Gary Roberts was phone. I mean, yeah, remember that day? There, you remember? <laughs> Can you remember I'm, the I'm day we walked in into his house and Joe Newendike was there, Gary Lehman, yeah, and uh, someone else too. Someone I, else. I was at his house tonight. <laughs> I was at his house tonight before, and I was fucking hungover as, as a dog. And anyway, he calls me up. He says, "You're coming down for dinner," which. Bird Dog used to phone me on Saturday and Saturdays eleven thirty or Sunday eleven thirty, depending on the football season. And I'd answer the phone and all I hear is, "What's on the go?" And that's that was code for we're getting on a day ball. Put your boots on. <laughs> so anyway, fucking. Uh, so anyway, when he called me that Sunday, I was like, "Ah, oh, Jesus Christ!" I don't know. So he called me and he said, "Yeah." He said, um, "He said, you know, you're coming down for dinner. Tammy's making Sunday dinner." I said, "Oh my God, Bird, really?" The next thing he says, "Well." You know, Joe and the two Garys are coming. I said, Dana, get your fucking shit out. Oh, the yeah, door. Gary anyway. Roberts was there. <laughs> yeah, Gary Roberts was there, Gary Lehman, and Joe Newendike. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. I walk in, and they're all introducing themselves, and I'm like, really? You know? Yeah. Come on. So we I mean, sat and had some wine and stuff. It was great. You know? That was bo- I didn't know either, Becker. I think you thought that I knew that, too. I didn't. I, I just, I, I had an alumni game with Gary Lehman, who, I, yeah. you know, and Lehman wanted to go visit Bird Dog. And yeah. I said, okay. So then I said, just give me a call later. I went home and did some shit, whatever I had to do. And then Bird phoned and yeah. said, yeah, yeah, pop over. I mean, I didn't even know if Lehman was going to be there at this point. I thought he'd left. And when you get yeah. there, you had three legends. Lehman was there with yeah. Gary Roberts and Joe Newendike. Legends. Um, yeah. yeah, and we sat so, down. Remember that? Remember just the stories? I just, I mean, yeah. I fucking talk a lot. And I, yeah. oh, I just really? listen. I know, I know. This really? was this was awesome. I, I didn't want to talk over Joe Newendike, every, Gary Roberts. Everything they said was gold. It was an unbelievable. And, yeah, that's right. You know, and a lot of it was about Bird. And we never heard those stories because yeah. Bird doesn't talk about himself like that a lot. No, and I've never like, I, and I've never seen Bird. So that was probably one of the happiest days I've ever seen in my life. Honest to God, just because it wasn't because he said, "Oh, I got my buddy Tommy here," and he's you know, I'm, I'm sitting with a couple. Of, it was just because he had his buddies over. And they were his buddies, no more than I was his buddy yeah. at that table there yeah. that night. 
and he just treated you know he just he just he was just so happy like i look back at that now and you know, it almost brings it almost makes me choke up because i just remember that day being probably one of the happiest days i've ever seen bird in my life and just not, I don't know about humble is the right word, but he was just like, you know, he knew who these guys were and I knew who these guys were, but he was just like, you know, we're just sitting around the table with a, with a bunch of guys who he played hockey with just the same as me and TR and Vinny and Michael and, and Jeremy were sitting around the table. It was that kind of feeling when I'm sitting there in the air my head's going, holy Christ, look at these guys. I can't believe I'm eating Sunday dinner with Gary Roberts and Joe Noonday. You you will have and to Gary get, uh... And Terry Ryan. <laughs> well... I was in the same boat. I couldn't <laughs> believe it either, man. You know, we took pictures yeah. that day, and I don't. It would probably be. I don't know if you got one. Shoot it over after this, because I'll post it this week for. Uh, when I do. Out. I have me. I have the four of us in the, or the the five of us in the kitchen. Wicked. I took it just before they left. Mental yeah, note. Okay. That. Well, um, yeah. look, thanks for coming on. Make a note of that because I'd love to post that for our podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll and uh, thanks a lot. Sure. Um, yeah, and Tommy. Thanks so much for coming especially, on. Especially, yeah, um, guys, I appreciate it. It's a great. It's a great cast you get going here. I must say, it's. Uh, and I, I got to uh, I got to say that uh, all the uh, Bird's family actually got hold of me this morning to find out, and I'm going to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. I do a lot of uh, social media work you myself, do. so I'll definitely pump this. I will definitely pump this for sure. Well, thanks, and thanks listen, it's been a lot of fun. I'd be there with you our, our day now. We got uh, some great guests coming up. We're going to be here for three yep. or four hours, and then I'm going to Blue okay. Rodeo. Uh, Jim right. Cuddy was right. nice enough. With, How or, funny you just said that. If you can hear it in the background, Blue Rodeo just kicked in funny oh, enough. There you go. Wow, yeah. there you see what I mean? Shit yeah. like that happens on the. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I'm telling you. It's on a day karma, like this. Brother, yeah, it's all, it's all karma. But yeah. look, so I'll be at that, and then I'm going to pop by Kelly's because I should, because it's Bird Dog yeah. Day. So if you guys are still Absolutely. there right before the concert and right after, I'll yeah, see you there. Touch, just fire me a text, and uh, if I'm still standing, we'll make sure you find us. Okay, buddy. Well, look, uh, right. in, in the wake of Bird Dog, uh, all things must pass, and that'll happen to that's everybody right. that's talking on here today. But, uh, you know, it's about what you do and leave behind, and Bird Dog was a legend and left a lot behind, and Absolutely. that's why we're talking about He's him. He's an incredible man. Okay, yeah, Becker, I love I'm, you, and I'm thanks. More than happy to join you today, guys. Thank you. Alrighty. All Enjoy. right. Thank Cheers, you. buddy. Thank you. Right. Bye. 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 Okay, ladies and gents, our next guest should need no introduction. If you are a Canadian, but here's one anyway. <laughs> yeah, but here's one anyway. If you are a Canadian, uh, we're not in a coma and had a TV set in the late '80s and '90s and beyond. You'll know him immediately. Uh, known as much for his on ice heroics as he is for being a best selling author and hell of a public speaker. Theo Fleury continues to be a great teammate even in retirement. The author of Playing with Fire, Theo thrust himself into the face of adversity so millions of others could be better off and not feel alone. I've always said that hockey imitates life. And the team first attitude it takes to succeed in the uh, on the ice spills over into the real world for all ex players. Theo uh, continues to be a legend on the ice and fight the good fight off of it. Ladies and gentlemen, a true beauty, former former warrior, uh, Golden Eagle, Flame, Avalanche, Ranger, Blackhawk, Giant, and Team Canada member and winner, Theo Fleury. Thanks for joining us uh, today, my buddy. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. That's a uh... The hell of an introduction. Well, <laughs> the introduction could go on for 20 minutes, and I fucking talk a lot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's it. And I wanted to get across the team first attitude, Theo, because we, we were dedicating today's show to Bird Dog. And yeah. I've often said, you know, Bird Dog, uh, I didn't even play with him. I played against him, and he was scary mm -hmm. as fuck. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I just I got so many stories. But uh, we became friends, especially when he settled over here in St. John's. And he would always... Mm -hmm be that team first guy. Now I'll let you go because I'm sure you've got better stories than I got on the subject and probably go back a little further. Yeah. Well, he, he was a part of the big Doug Gilmore trade that absolutely buried us, uh, for, for yeah. many years. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I, he's a really like, he's such a incredible guy, you know? Uh, and talk about a guy who would do anything for his teammates, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I absolutely enjoyed him because uh, he had a love of the game of golf like I did. And so him and I spent, we had some epic rounds of golf, you know, and he was a really competitive guy. And, and this know? would have been and when, Theo, in the late 80s? Like, I'm, I'm like guessing nine, you came nine, across him in, 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 in Calgary or nine, Salt Lake. Yeah, 93. But I... Okay. I remember him when he was with the Nordiques. Yeah. You know, he was just this big giant of a guy. And he, 
I can just, this, I can uh, just imagine Bird Dog is the type of guy that, yeah, if, you, if you're coming up against a team that he's on, you're fucking aware that he's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, I, I, I'd seen those epic scenes of him in the penalty box. I think it was in Edmonton. Yes. You know, and, and, uh, yeah, he, he was, like, he was a crazy guy on the ice, but off the ice, you know, he had a heart of gold and, you know, he would do anything for you. I know I'll, I'll never, my, my favorite bird dog story is, uh, we were at the back alley in Calgary one night. You know what? And it was, and it was, uh, I'm so glad you day, went here. <laughs> Keep the, going. The, the day that, that the, they announced the strike in 93. Remember we went on strike yep. with about two or three games left in the season. So we'd all been out at this brewery having one of those NHL PA meetings, right? And so we all had a few in us and we're like, well, we can't, we can't ruin our buzz by going home. So we went to this place called the back alley and it was a biker bar. Okay. Yes. So I remember we, walk that into the, we, we walk into the bar and bird goes up to the, up to the bar, says to the bartender, I'll have a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> and the guy's like, uh, I can't give you a bottle of Jack Daniels. He goes, Put it in a pitcher and give me a glass of ice, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there must and and uh, there was a bunch of pool tables too, right? And the place was packed, like it was packed. Yeah. And so there had to be, I don't know, forty names on the chalkboard. People, you know, waiting to play pool. So what does Bird do? He goes up there rubs all the names off this chalkboard <laughs> and puts and puts bird dog okay <laughs> oh. Oh. Then he goes back to the bar grabs his pitcher of jack daniels and his glass of ice and there's this little skinny guy who's next up on the pool table and he's putting his money in the in the uh pool table so bird goes up and taps him on the shoulder and says uh Hey, can you read the chalkboard over there? Kid goes, yeah. He goes, what does it say? He says, bird dog. And bird dog goes, that's me. He goes, beat it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, then, and then at the end of the night, they had this big pole in the middle of the bar. Yes. And so he, cl- he climbed the pole uh. and slipped and fell off. And there there's an old car in the middle <laughs> of the thing, and he absolutely like accordioned this car in the middle of the thing, and then we got into a big brawl with a bunch of bikers, and oh my god, it was. I remember it was an, it was an epic night, and if 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 I were to describe Bird Dog, that is it to a T right there. That was him every day, all day, just lipping off. Mouthing off <laughs> nonstop every day, and a lot of it, you know. And Bird knew that he he was one for a good story too. Um, and you know, I'd heard that. This is funny, Theo. I'd heard that, and this, I've come across you four different times, and you, you wouldn't remember the the first few. Um, the first time Theo I met you was when they retired Wayne's number all over the league, and it was in Edmonton. They retired ninety nine, yeah. and I went to see my buddy Darren Lang, and he fought Larock, yeah. and uh, that night, and um. And you, you were at the Rangers, and uh, a couple of years later, after you had uh, gone through some tough times that you were very public about, uh, my buddy Steve Parsons, and uh, oh, Steve, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I in Calgary, this is weird. Like I've never had a chance to really sit down and chat with you, but I came across you a couple times in 2007. I've got a stepson, just a step away for a little bit. I got a stepson, and his his father was B.J. Young. I played with him in Red Deer. He played one game for Detroit. He died in a car accident. And you came, um, and, and, and Tyson moved here to Newfoundland with me, um, and he's back out now playing Junior B in Northern Alberta in St. Paul. But the point being, at the time, you were sitting outside the dressing room. I said, you know, I know he knows Purse, and I met Theo uh, a few years ago with Langer. I said, who knows? So I went over. And I was, you were just standing there. And sure enough, you came over to Tyson. I say this because I really appreciated it. And this is the kind of guy, it, it, point being, is no fluke that Theo's the same kind of guy. I often said that sacrifice and team, 
you know, bonding. It, it spills over into the regular life. You came over and asked Tyson if he want, would want a picture. And the, we talked a little bit about Bird Dog. And you called me aside. For, it was all kinds of people around. But you told me that story. And I forgot the first part of it. Uh, and then, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. The next time I, I flukely came across you was about 2010. And you, for some reason, you were in the West Edmonton Mall water park. And I found myself there with Tyson, who was a few years older. And sure enough, I said, you know, I just met you briefly and brought up Bird Dog again. And you went right to that story. So <laughs> clearly, because I've often said to people, I'm like, you know, Bird Dog, anybody comes across him. If you're a teammate, even for a summer in ball hockey, you will have a Bird Dog story. And he resonates. And like I was saying to, to Tommy Beckett, yeah. all things must pass. We're all yeah. in for the same fate. But it's yeah. what you leave behind. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's absolutely. also a hell of a story. So it, would be, it, it makes sense for it to be the go to, yeah. right? If you got yeah. that one in the chamber, it's coming out all well, the like, time. <laughs> and, and you would, you would never hear a story like that in today's game. Guaranteed. You certainly right? wouldn't. And, and, you know, Theo, <laughs> another part of, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, if you did it, it almost, you'd, you'd probably be reprimanded for it. Um, no, which no is, question. you know, in some ways is good, in some ways bad. But point being, the boys were the boys. And, you know, Bird was doing that as much for uh, team bonding and, and, you know, a good yeah. time with everybody well, as anything. He, he, he was old school before they even invented old school. So That's a great quote. And you know <laughs> what? There's one for a T-shirt, Mike. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that that with the, the fucking promo shot they have of Bird Dog, like his hockey DB picture is him with that, like, flat top mullet and this massive but mustache. But the thing is, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> yeah, that and old school before old school. Which, just, like, just think about Theo had to play these guys old school before old school. Like, yeah. now I often say, like, Johnny Goodrow, there's st- it's still... You know, Goudreau can go out there and play and being small, even though the the average size is still the same. But back then, if you had if you were small, you had to have a lot of spunk to go against guys like Bird Dog because in the front of the net, Theo, imagine now. Now I'm not I'm not trying to inflate your tires, but back then, you know, for you go in front of the net, even with you know, as time wore on in your career, Pronger or any of them, you were allowed to cross check, you were allowed to slash, and Bird Dog was notorious for it. I mean he was oh, just, yeah. you know, and so for a guy he's, like I mean he was vicious. I'm six foot, almost six foot one, yeah. almost 200 pounds. And I played three yeah. years in the American League against him. And it was torture for me. I, I mean, yeah. yeah, for you. And then, I mean, you had him as a teammate as well. well and, so you and, must have saw him. And he used those double fiberglass cohos. You remember those? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yeah, I, yeah. Do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> no. Oh, the right? worst. Oh, oh yeah. Man. Well, Another great story about Bird Dog was when he came to Calgary, Dave King was our coach, okay? Yeah. And and obviously, Bird Dog was not Dave King's kind of guy, <laughs> oh <God>. right? <laughs> no. That's apples and, and so, oranges if I've ever fucking yeah. heard it. Yeah. And so, so I think Bird sat out, like, I don't know, seven or eight games in a row, okay? And every time... Because Kinger would not like he would he would announce the lineup in morning skate at the end of morning skate, okay. And so as soon as that happened, and Bird knew his he wasn't getting called that night, he would take a full slapper, ankle high, right at Kinger's ankle every <laughs> time, every time he sat him out. And thank God, like thank God he didn't hit him because he would have broke his ankle because. Bird had a big time slap shot too, you know. So and he he did that Theo once. I was telling the story earlier. I was playing in Fredericton in the playoffs, and Michelle Terrian was my coach, and we had a few tough guys. And uh, Bird thought I, whatever it was, we went past our we went a minute past when we were supposed to practice, and he came on our ice and started taking slap shots ankle high, <laughs> and he right. and he hit Roly Melanson. <laughs> It was. I, I still say I've never seen anything like it, and you just fucking told me the same story. And people, people think when we're saying this that he might have just shot one down in that end to prove a point. I'm no. saying no, 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 no. He shot it at him. No, he was. He was. He was trying to hit bone. Oh yeah. man. But that. But that was it. He got out of it. I remember t- towards the, the end of latter part of his career, early 2000s, the Hockey News had that plus minus section. Yeah. And in the minus, it was Greg Smith becomes the most suspended player ever. And guys, I mean, in today's game, I, I don't, I, again, I don't even know, 
And I'm not saying this in, in negative against Bird Dog. He knew the parameters of the game then, oh, and yeah, he yeah. knew he was drafted in the second round, right? Yeah, As yeah. a guy like, like that, a high second round. He was scored twenty second overall. It's not like people were yeah. you know dumbfounded by the fact that he had forty five goals or anything as a D. He was yeah. a stay at home D. He was but he the, was yeah. he was twenty second overall. Yeah, in the draft. and you'd often I mean yeah. he'd 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 know that it was, he was in the uh, Bird as when he coached me he would often say it's a game of chess, not checkers. In mm-hmm. other words, you know I slash guys in the first period. I knew I was going to get a penalty, but see if they're going to do it in the third yeah right oh yeah and again exactly. that, that, that was for his team yeah um well you know if 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 they're making a uh a version of of the old slap shot movie yeah like bird bird could be a character in that movie <laughs> well <laughs> they, they could write they could write bird's part into that movie and it, and it, he's he was perfect for that. Yeah, it could be nonfiction, and it would be way more interesting than the Hansons. <laughs> we were talking about. Oh, yeah. Can you remember ninety two, ninety three when they came I, for some absurd reason? It, they said you didn't. You know, they came back with you don't have to wear a helmet if you don't want to, and he was the only yeah, fucking guy right. that did it. Yeah, yeah. he's the only guy. We, that we were did talking it. about this. Yeah, we talked about this. It was. Uh, I and, guess it was Gil Stein was thought that like if you could see a like American audiences could see a player's head better, they'd like follow the game yeah. more. But <laughs> and, and nobody we actually did. And we were saying and like he, that was he's, he signed the waiver. Yeah. <laughs> and then the first game we played in Vancouver, he got into a fight and absolutely like smoked his head on the ice. <laughs> no way. After the fight. And yeah, then he put the helmet back on. No we fucking like, way! Happened? Jesus, because we were like, "Bird, come on, man!" Like seriously. Well, you can't I, play. You can't play without a helmet on. Well, we were also talking about the fact that you guys also had like Al McKinnis, like notorious, like the the hardest slap shot. Just like well, as yeah. a kid, you knew like growing up, I knew Al McKinnis had the hardest <laughs> slap shot in hockey. And like you're on the t- ice with that guy, <laughs> you got no and you're up. opting not to wear a bucket, and it just seems ridiculous to me. But <laughs> he knew that he knew that it made everybody else that much scared of him too, because he seemed like a. Fu- <laughs> it just added to his legend. Like I said, he's Paul fucking well, Bunyan. Yeah, but he only did it for one game. Um, Is that what you're yeah, saying? One game. That was it. Because he cracked his head on the ice. Jesus. Christ. Well, you know what? Good, good thing. Because if he if he'd left that off, who knows what would have happened. Yeah, but I think the ice hurt after, and it wasn't him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's yeah. Bird dog falls and hit, hits the ice, and the ice is the one that's hurt from it. He's like it's like those old Chuck <laughs> Norris jokes, right? It's just yeah. it's all bird dog. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you'll be happy to know, yeah. Theo. So a bunch of his, I mean, he left a great impact over here in St. John's. No one really expected. I don't know of anybody else that did that, that came here and, and it, it, to St. John's and embraced it as much as he did. He's from Mississauga. So all the boys, he stayed here and his, his partner, Tammy Tilly, um, you know, they had a house together and they're all downtown today uh, having a few drinks for those that do. For those that don't, they got pizzas and sandwiches. And it's like a big celebration of his life. So... We're really uh, appreciative that you could come on today and even talk for for just a little bit. Um, but I do have a couple yeah, more no questions, problem. if that if that's no okay. Problem. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> you yourself. I mean, you've become. For, uh, before this, you know what I'm going to get to. When I just earlier spoke of meeting you with Tyson, that was 2007, 2008, and I stayed out in it because I played junior in Red Deer, even though I'm from St. John's. Yeah. And um, I stayed out and played with the Bentley Generals. So in 2008, yeah, yeah. we went to a, the, your game there. You had the penalty shot snipe. Um, mm-hmm. and, and which was, I don't know if that got enough attention if people realize what happened there, but you would want, you'd mentioned wanting to have a comeback and you, you, you came back with the Flames. I believe you were 42 or 43 at the time, not to give away your age, um, but I just fucking did. Uh but, you know, and you had that – it was a great way, I think, to close that chapter. Would you, were you content with the way things ended there in Calgary? Yeah. You know, uh, I, think, I think more importantly, the reason why I, I wanted to make the comeback was I didn't, want to, I didn't want to retire as a suspended player. And I knew if there was any hope of me – Maybe one day getting getting into the Hockey Hall of Fame. If I was a suspended player, that would have never happened, right? So, basically, wow. I went through the process uh, not thinking about you know making a comeback. I just you know I I just started. It was funny because I I sat down with my ex wife in February and I said, 
you know, I want to make a comeback. And I was like 225 pounds and, you know, I was out of shape. I hadn't played hockey in six years. And, and wow. she kind of looked at me and laughed at me. And, and, uh, and so I started down the road of, you know, getting in shape. And, and what happened was three weeks before I actually went to training camp, I got a call from Daryl Sutter, who was the flames GM at the time. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, have you been reinstated yet? And I said, no, I said, I'm working towards that, you know, that, that reinstatement process. And, and he says, well, if you do get cleared before a training camp, we want you to come to Calgary. I was like, perfect. You know, I was living in Calgary and, and all that. And so the night before training camp opened, I had to fly to Phoenix because all that Phoenix uh, Coyotes shit was going down. They didn't know whether the team was going to move yeah. or stay or whatever. And that's where Gary Bettman was. And so I flew to Phoenix. I met with Gary. He said, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to reinstate you. And so uh, I got reinstated that night. I flew back to Calgary. And the next morning I was at Flames training camp. And, uh, you know, doing the fitness test. And uh, out of the 52 guys that were at training camp, so kids that were half my age, yeah, I finished 11th in the fitness test. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> you know, ahead of, ahead of, ahead of everybody. So I lost 45 pounds, you know, and I actually had the best scores of my whole entire life were when I was 41 years old making this comeback. So even in my prime, I wasn't testing as good as I did, uh, that day. And so, and so I got into my first exhibition game and, uh, the building was completely sold out. All yes. of my scalper buddies were calling me, thanking me for making this comeback because they were making big bucks that night. And uh, and so I played in this game, and uh, it was really weird how this game went because it was kind of back and forth and ended in, ended in a tie. And so we get a power play in overtime. And, uh, and at the end of the overtime, Ole Okunen shoots the puck in the net. Okay. Yeah. But instead of the red light coming on, the green light came on because he ran out of time, but the puck went in that. But then it set the stage for this shootout, right? Yeah. And you've played for the Sutter brothers, haven't you? Uh, yeah. Well, in Red, in, in red, in in, red Deer? In Bentley, yeah. Uh, in Red Deer, they came in right, right after me. But I know, I know yeah. them well. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sitting on the bench and I get fucking kicked in the back of my hockey pads. And I look and it's Brent and he's like, hey, you're going to shoot second, right? So I start friggin' laughing, right? Because I'm going, you know, if you wrote this as a Hollywood script, you, you know, they'd throw it out, right? <laughs> no, you it's know? too obvious. Like, it's, it's it, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, it, it, so, it's, it's, it's too so, crazy, yeah. So, <laughs> so our, guy, our guy shoots first. He misses. The Islander guy sh- shoots. He misses. Okay, so it sets the stage. So I step on the ice. Everybody's going fucking crazy in the stands, all this stuff, right? So as I as I step onto the ice, I start fucking laughing, right? Because I'm like, okay, like I got a score now, right? You know? <laughs> you have to. Yeah. There's, no, there's no option. <laughs> you know? But breakaways is my forte. I never miss breakaways. So I wasn't, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't, you know. So I picked up the puck. I went in and scored and fucking blew the roof off. Blew the roof off. Right? You certainly did. And, and I mean, like, uh, that was also, be- like, prior to coming back like that. I mean, it was only after the, the 04, lo- uh, 05 lockout that they had brought in shootouts like that. So it wasn't ever part yeah. of the game, like, during the rest of your career, right? Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah. Well, I, no, I, I mean, like, every, I think that every team should have should be allowed to have, like, one shootout specialist where he doesn't even play. He just sits in the dressing room. <laughs> Wouldn't that be the great? whole night? You know, remember and that guy? Yeah. With, and he comes out with a special jersey on, like you know, he could have the 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 McDonald's arches. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? if that was the case, you could still do it. Um, I'd be still pl- I'd be still playing. You know, you know what's funny, Theo? I was Damon Lankow was a teammate of mine. Well, my line mate in junior. Uh, we both were first round picks together. We went through that process. So Lanx is still a buddy. I don't talk to him as much as I should, but he got me tickets that night. I was in the building. You went forehand. You went backhand. You you, yeah. you deke backhand. You pulled it over forehand, 
and slipped it in the net. I, I, I remember, I hope there's that video footage is out there. I had goosebumps, by the way. I brought that up because uh, my, the very son, I was uh, my stepson that I was telling you about that you had met about a year before that. Mm-hmm. And you're right, you were, I wouldn't have brought it up, but you were a lot plumper. When we met, when we talked to you in 2007, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then to see you come back. And, now I knew, like I said, I, I was out there living with Paris for some of the time, so I kind of knew what oh, was going that's to. Right. Yeah, so that's Paris right. Paris that's was right. uh, filling me in, and you know I said yeah. I, I had come across you, so I was uh, you know rooting for you, and still am. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, now I, outside, I, 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 I said uh, I said after the game, I said I deked the goalie out so bad he helped the goal judge flick the light on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember the, the leg kicking right up over the crossbar, man. You did. You did a great job on that. I, mm-hmm. I never forget it, man. I had goosebumps. Now, this brings yeah. me to my next question because I don't if, – if people weren't totally – if their memories were rusty on that, I tell you one that I remember happening. I wasn't there for it. Shortly after this, tell me how it happened that you got a hit in fucking pro baseball. <laughs> I remember it happening. Like I said, I was out in Red there, and I remember some parse yeah. brought it up. He said, yeah, Theo's playing. I'm like, what? Was it the Vipers? Calgary Vipers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened yeah. there? Because I don't have any idea. I would just remember hearing this story and remembering it should have been front page for a week. How the fuck did this happen? I'm not taking away from your athleticism. I'm sure yeah, yeah. It, it must be a great, but I mean, you must have played baseball before A and B. How in the hell did it happen that you came to plate for the Vipers? <laughs> well, I was actually a better baseball player and I was a hockey player. Wow. Can you believe that? Wow. Um, I, was a, I was a catcher and... Uh, but there wasn't too many five foot six catchers in the majors. So I thought I'd, <laughs> you I'd you, went, to, you I'd, went to the NHL where there were so many more five foot six guys. Yeah, yeah, true enough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, baseball in Canada is not as big as it was in the U.S. Right. And yeah. So you know, I just decided to go the hockey route. But anyways, I started a business in Calgary, and it was a concrete business with my uh, with my two brothers, but we started this business and we got like, we got into everything. We were doing everything. And then I, I ran into this, uh, airbrush guy. Uh, and, uh, we started this clothing line called flurry flurry's artistic custom enterprises or whatever. It was called fake S A K E. Wow. And so, so we went to see the Vipers to see if they'd be interested in, you know, uh, se- selling some of our swag at their ball games, and then I got to talking to the to the PR guy, the marketing guy that runs the team, and I told him, I said I was a better baseball player, I was a hockey player. He's like, do you want to fucking play? Wow. I'm like, what do you mean? Do you? He's like, yeah. He says we got a doubleheader coming up this weekend. He said you can sign a one day contract, and he goes, you can you can play for the team. It'd be great. We'll get some fans out here, and you guys can promote your clothing line and all that. And so. I spent a week leading up to the thing. I was there every day. I was taking batting practice, shagging balls. And, 20 years you know, worth of batting stuff. practice in a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having, like, having the time of my life, right? And so I get I get into this game. And uh, first at bat, I get a base hit right up the middle. And, uh, yeah. That's incredible. And then I, had two, I, had, I had two more at bats after that. And, uh Obviously, I hadn't seen a 95 mile an hour fastball in a long time, and so, yeah, it well, was uh, it was interesting. I could hear the ball as it left the guy's hand. That's how know. hard he was throwing. That's you know I, I've you never know, seen that. that. I play baseball you know that, too, but I've never I've never seen one come in over 90. Oh, it was um, unbelievable. Just senior level. I mean, you went right. Yeah, yeah. you were playing pro. Yeah, I mean, so I, I actually I actually should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame because. <laughs> You know, I, I uh, retired with a 333 batting average. That's just um, fucking incredible and adds to the legend. And the thing is, good on you for doing it. A lot of people a lot of people could probably use their swag if there's a, a sports star in a city and put themselves into that position. And uh, I don't know if a lot would really follow through on it. It takes some balls to stand up there actually in the batter's box. Okay, here it is. Now I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm Theo Fleury. I've been a legend in another sport. Now here I am. I mean, I, that's why I often give it to Michael Jordan. I give him credit for that. People think he went crazy. Whatever the fuck he did, he went and hit 267 in AAA baseball. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. 
And, I know. You know, if you if you yeah. think about what that what what that is, I mean, and you you lived that for a little bit, Theo, and you know, God love you for it. Yeah. But here we are. Look, we, we got to take off because uh, it's a bird dog special, and we got some other guests. Darren Kimball is going to come on next, actually. Oh, awesome. Um, awesome! And look, it's great talking to you. I could keep going. There's so many areas we could we could give it. And we'll a shout definitely out. we'll definitely bring um, you back, and and we'll get into all well, this you know stuff. What? You it's know what, just... guys? You know what? I was uh, I just spent uh, eight days in Labrador. I just got home. Uh, when was it? On Tuesday, I was up. Uh, I was up along the north coast of Labrador. Uh, I was in five communities. I did 11 speeches in five days. And, wow. And uh, Rigolette and Makovic and Hopedale all up there. And, yeah, it was an incredible Interesting. Incredible I uh, I do and, some work up, and, up there. Uh, did you and, hit Nat uh, Yeah, yeah. Nat Washeesh, and, okay. Uh, so so that's, that's great. That's, and, I'm familiar uh, with that place. You know what? I absolutely love the Maritimes. It's when I get to go out there and, and hang out with the people, it's just incredible experience. And, and I don't think people in Canada realize how absolutely stunningly beautiful it is, you know, in the Maritimes. Well, thanks. That's uh, it's a real compliment because you've been to Newfoundland and, and Atlantic Canada, the Mar- all over the Maritimes. And you know that we, uh, we take a lot of pride in, in, you know, where we come from and we hope to be hospitable as, as a group. Uh, I know Big that's, time. that's why I, you know, I played, hockey all over and i i ended up coming back it's why bird dog came here and you know to go to those places i appreciate it i go over the, the, those northern trips sometimes with the nhl alumni i go with ally afraid yep. al's a common denominator on a lot of those things we just went to natwashish and nain last year and did some charity events oh cool um, oh awesome so i know exactly what you mean it and it is it's more beautiful than anything um yeah, as as is St. Cool John's, place. we just got a little bit yeah, more hus- hustle absolutely. and bustle here. But look, yeah. th- thanks la- again, Theo. You're an awesome guest. Anytime. And you're an Anytime. interesting guy. And, and we will uh, definitely get you back on in the future and talk more about baseball and everything. It's, yeah, it's just sure. It's uh, been incredible having you on. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and to chat about bird dog and stuff. Yeah, well, he was a good, he was a good man and... Uh, you know, I have nothing but uh, fond memories and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of laughs, a lot of laughs. So. Well, now that's good, and that's a common denominator that's coming up a lot today, yeah. uh, just like we thought. So, he, he was one of a kind. They, well, they, hopefully they, they broke the, they broke the mold after they made made him. I totally agree with you, and hopefully um, we catch up before another year goes by because you're a great guest. And, uh, you, you know, anything you want to talk about before we go off the air here? I know you're public speaking a ton. Uh, so if you if you ever even, Theo, if you want to talk about anything, uh, we do have some uh, great listenership. We have, uh, you know, tens of thousands of listeners uh, already. And I'd love you to come on if you want to promote anything because, uh, you sure. know, th- these causes need attention. And I look at everything you're doing, man, and it's... Uh, it's totally uh, commendable, and uh, you know you've got a lot of fans out there, not only on the ice now but off of it. So thank you again, and we'll talk soon. All right, all right. Talk Keep soon. up the good work, guys. Keep up the good work. Thanks for having me. All Appreciate right, buddy. It. Thanks, Theo. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Penny Posh. Maternity wear reimagined. Breaking the barriers of style, fit, and comfort that often leave mothers-to-be uninspired in their new wardrobe, Penny Posh's designs have reinvented a clothing category often seen as disposable, temporary, and unattractive. Well, not with Penny Posh. Check it out. A continuous fit maternity collection from bump to bundle and beyond. You can check them out on Twitter at Penny underscore Posh, on Instagram at Penny Posh underscore maternity and of course on their website www.pennyposhdesigns.com Penny Posh Designs Maternity Wear Reimagined Okay, here we go. Uh, Ladies and gents, our next guest is one of the toughest players from one of the toughest eras. The game as hockey has ever seen amassed over a thousand penalty minutes in over 300 games and he'd probably have had more but nobody wanted to fight him. Uh, The former... (laughs) <laughs> the former, the former, here we go. Swift Current Indian, Calgary Wrangler, New Westminster Bruin, Brandon Wheat King, Prince Albert Raider, Quebec Nordique, Halifax Citadel, St. Louis Blue, Providence Bruin, Boston Bruin, <laughs> Chicago Blackhawk, I- Indiana- Indianapolis Ice, Albany River Rat, Manitoba Moose, Kansas City Blade, San Antonio Dragon, Shreveport Mugbug, Arkansas Glacier Cat, love that one, my favorite of the bunch, Missouri River Otter, and Peoria Riverman. Now that is a resume. <laughs> 
Darren. <laughs> and that's, that's a well-traveled man right there. It is, and I've often said that's what I love about the sport. I, you know, I was a bit of a suitcase, and I just loved every place I went. You, you get to yeah. experience so much, see so many different cultures. It's the best, best education there is. And, uh, I mean, first of all, because obviously here now we have another guest. We just had Theo on. Uh, Theo Fleury, and, you know, we could go a thousand ways with this interview because you're such an interesting guest. We are going to, uh, for purposes of the day, being the anniversary that uh, our buddy Bird Dog passed away, we're going to try to stick on that trajectory of the Bird Dog traje- trajectory. So my first question to you, and by the way, before we start, just so the public knows here, so we're talking to Darren now. He's at a tournament in Cedar Rapids, and your kid just, what happened? Well, he went and hit a guy, and his mask come up, and uh, probably uh, I don't know three or four stitches he's gonna have to get. So I'm sitting outside the hospital waiting. So I'm playing hockey and sitting outside hospitals. I guess I've done it before, so I guess I might as well just hang and bang, right? Imagine, yeah, yeah, and it seems totally normal. And here we are agreeing to just go around it. And you know, I appreciate it. I know exactly where you're fucking coming from, so it's all good. How, how old's um, the kid? Uh, he's four, he's fourteen, but it, you know what? The kids the kids okay. It's what I'm gonna have to fucking deal with when I get home. Though that's what's not gonna be good. So. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Fair enough. That's so the that's, problem. So this, this is a, a bantam, I guess. At fourteen, is it? Yeah, yeah. second year bantam. So they'll be yeah. They so they got about three more weeks left, and then we'll be uh, on to uh, the, the next season already. It's, so uh, it's St. Louis minor hockey, right? Yeah, St. Louis. We are. We're a Triple A team out of St. Louis. There's two of them there, so we're we're one of them, and uh, we're named Car Shield. And uh, you, you know, you got to travel quite a bit being in St. Louis. It's uh, nobody really yeah. wants to get there. You're sort of in the middle of nowhere, so well, you're traveling you, all the time. You know what's funny? It is, but on the other hand, we've talked to some guests lately, and they keep bringing that up. How you know St. Louis is becoming a hotbed. for We were American talking about hockey. it last week when we had Colby we were, on the St. show. Louis we were and Phoenix. We brought up yeah, uh, how good, how strong the, the minor hockey program is there in St. What? Louis, and Ooh, it was. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about how you're seeing a lot more guys come up through, and uh, we were saying like Trent Frederick well, who just started playing a for the lot, Bruins a, a and lot, stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of it happens though when you go to uh, the year they had the five kids that are drafted, and uh, you know four, I think five, four of them went in the first round, maybe five did, and then the yeah. sixth one went in the second. So that put a spotlight on St. Louis, and you know there's some there's some alumni guys that have been around here doing a lot of hard work, and um, you know get involved in the minor hockey, so it's. It's quite good. It's you know the, the guys are giving back, which uh, that's that's a nice thing to see. And of that's, course, you've got your uh, you've got your own podcast, the St. Louis Blues podcast that you do with Jamie, right? Yeah. So and, and that's and you know Jamie's doing a lot. Jamie's a big. Uh, uh, we, we do our podcast, but Jamie's he's involved. He does a program called Synergy, where they go out and they do uh, classes for all the teams are around St. Louis, and uh, all the kids are involved with it. And you know he's a busy man, and he's working with the Blues also. So. You know, hats off to Jamie. He's, uh, he's putting in his time right now, that's for sure. I didn't realize that. I was wondering, because I see references to it on Twitter. I wasn't really sure what it was all about, so yep. thanks for the explanation. Yep. Now, what we're going to get to yep. now, uh, you, as, as you sit there with your kid's chin dripping blood, uh, <laughs> we're going to ask you, maybe it's appropriate, of all those places I just mentioned, so where did you come across the bird dog, and do you have a story that really sticks out? Well, I, you know, the, the the very first thing, uh, so when I get drafted to Quebec, uh, uh, Bird, at some point in time, I don't know if it's my first year or second year, I, you know, I'm getting old, but Bird gets traded from Philadelphia to, uh, to Quebec. So I remember my very first time that I ever ran into Bird Dog, we were sitting, They, we, I got drafted, I believe I get drafted, and I, I come in and they fly all the young kids in, and they had all the younger guys, that first year guys, second year guys, which that would have included Bird Dog, and... So we're sitting in a room and we're getting ready to, uh, you know, get introduced to the coaching staff, all the scouts and that they're all there and they want to have a, you know, they're, they're doing this physical thing for us. And so here comes bird dog in and he's with Max Middendorf and Ma- Max is a, both guys are six foot four, six foot five. And so we're in the middle of summertime cause that's when the draft was. And this is shortly after it. And these two guys come walking in and, you know, I'm in, you know what my role was and I'm sitting there going, well, fuck, what's going to go on here? You know, I'm going to eventually these guys must be tough guys. Cause they're six, five, you know, big buggers. And they got Max has got his shades on and bird dog's got his shades on and, he, and bird dog's walking in with that cocky walk of his. And I'm, you know, and I, so it's the first time I ever meet him and, uh, or okay. see him. So I don't really, I don't really get to know him until a little later on when we played in Halifax, but the first presence of the man, you know, he's a big man. He was a big man. 
Oh boy. And, uh, and I mean, how relieved were you though? Uh, that like, I mean, you got drafted uh, in 88. It was that summer that bird dog got traded to the flyers. How happy were you that you didn't have to play against them? <laughs> well, you know what though? This, this, uh, this bird dogs, the thing with bird dog is, and uh, if, you, if you play the game and, and you play the role that, uh, that I played, you know, there's a, a lot of guys that I, I had to deal with and I, I was real good friends with and, and, you know, but it was a fucking job you had to do. So, you know, there was a training camp that I went on with bird dog and, and I did bird dog. We'd become friends. And there was a training camp at one point in time where I was actually uh, Gord Donnelly. And I went in and I fought Gordo and uh, I did really well. And uh, so then the next year when Gordy gets traded, I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm the guy that's there and bird dogs running around camp like bird dog does. And there's some guys that he doesn't like and he's doing this shit. And I'm, you know, and I'm going to bird and well, bird smarting the fuck up here. Cause you know, cause you know what's going to happen. We're going to end up going and, and fucking as hard headed as he was, he wasn't fucking going to listen to me. So he kept on doing it. So I got all these fucking scouts and them looking around the coaching staff and going, Hey, Kimby, what are you going to do? And so you, you got no choice. So I had to go fight bird dog. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't, it was a fight that I went and fought and I, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta stand up for yourself cause you're in the game for yourself first and foremost. Uh, friendships, you know, are hard to, they're there, but, but you still got to take care of yourself because there's a family you're dealing with. And so we fought and it was, you know, he got a, he got a little bit of a swollen ear on me. He was bitching at me about that after the fight, but his, um, it's just a part of the game and I I respected him for it. I I love playing with a man. He reminded me a lot of myself. So, you know, I, I I wasn't pissed off at him. I got it. I I understood what he was doing because he's trying to get out out of the minors himself and, so, you know, that's just the unfortunate part of the game of hockey at that time that you, well, know, you yeah. still have to fight these guys. Especially the era that you're coming through. I mean, Darren, I, I, re- I mean, I remember I was right in that uh, they say, you know, you remember a lot from when you're like 10 to 15 years old, and I watched a lot. I believe you fought Twister, didn't you? You fought Tony Twist? Yeah, I, I fought him a bunch of times, yeah. A bunch, a bunch of, times. of times. He's the one guy Shane Corson told me. He said, I fought Domi, I remember, in uh, the first time I was like 18, and, and he said, look, it's all cool. And he said, "Ty's real tough, but don't do that when we're playing against Tony Twist. He's, he'll break your orbital bone." I, oh, <laughs> and Bird used to speak of it. Bird, Bird used to love those old tough guy stories because the further we get away from that, um, and, and you know, yeah. I, I, I get it. We don't need to have an argument here or a debate over fighting or, and versus non-fighting. It was just Bird came from that era. He was very proud of it, but he showed me a tape, a v- yeah. VCR tape, and he called it his uh, his resume. And there was a time in <laughs> in Halifax. I don't even know if you guys talked about it. I found it absolutely absurd. He, he got out of the penalty box. He had a breakaway, and he took a flip shot and ran the goalie over. I said, like, <laughs> the boys, that, that's how much he didn't give a fuck about stats. You know, you, you figure you get a breakaway, you're going to try to dangle. You're going to try to do something. Yeah. You know, can't hurt to pad your stats with a goal. Bird didn't care. And I forget who was in the net. I think it was Shevel Day or one of those guys. But anyway, put the net up <laughs> that's on incredible. a breakaway. So my next question would be, Halifax, because now Halifax really took to the junior. But I mean, you you guys didn't quite as get as many fans, but you were well known throughout the community. And we flew up a couple times. Being in St. John's growing up, you know, we didn't have the Maple Leafs yet when I was a kid. So, in order yep. to see any professional hockey, you, you go to Toronto to see an NHL game. But we, you know, I saw a few have Halifax Citadels games way before I knew. I, I got to know Bird Dog. I watched because it was the closest place we could yeah. go and watch. And I thought you guys had a great reputation in the community. Uh, you know, do you want to comment on that, on Halifax and back in the day? I know you didn't get as many fans, but, you know, it must have been a fun place to play. Yeah, you know what? It was It was, uh, it, it was a time – we had a lot of guys that were down in – the Quebec Nordiques weren't doing very good, so they had, they had a bunch of guys. And we're so we're sitting in, in Halifax – and uh, Carpenter was our coach the first time. The, the second go around, though, when Robbie Fatoric was there, I'd been, I got sent down for three weeks or something. And, and that's when, you know, when we were down there, we had the toughest, we probably had the toughest team in the minors at that point. We had with Severin was there, Bird Dog was there, uh, Shaughnessy, Jacques Mayotte was in and out of there. So we had lots of guys that were fighting. And, uh, and we had Ken Quinney and these guys. It was old Dean Hopkins, an old guy. He's a boy guy from Halifax. Off he is. Um, but we, the, the town... I think the town started to gravitate towards us a little bit because we were getting news in the hockey news of being a, a tough team and uh, one of the toughest teams in the minors. And, and my, my rankings, I was pretty, um, I, w- I was pretty popular at the time. I things were going well for me and then the fighting department. And so everyone was sort of liking the tough part. We were winning hockey games. Also Robbie Fatoric, uh, probably one of my favorite coaches of all time. He just, he just kept you on your toes. He was just goofy as shit, but he kept you on your toes. And, 
and how and you know so we had the you'd play hockey games and during the day and we we had a group of guys that were a pretty tight knit group and we would go to practice we'd come out and my apartment was sitting there about all these about forty bars are sitting there also and you know guys were involved in the community and and I think. I think that helped us out a lot in Halifax because I think, you know, the fans started to get a little better as we we're going on and we had a good team. It just got, we, they just didn't keep us down there. They made, Quebec made some silly moves and called some guys up that they should have kept down in the minors probably. And we could have took a run at it. I think, you know, I always find, yeah, I felt that really weird about playing in the American league. Like you can't really judge any standings. Even if you're fans, you have to get used to the revolving door. It's a little bit more solidified. If you watch major junior, or even if you watch the yep. NHL, but if you're watching the AHL, yeah, your team could finish in first place in yep. the minors and last place up top, or, or even just barely scrape into the playoffs up top. Now they need five of your players, and you know it, it totally changes. Yep. So I, I can see why it would have been a little bit harder to adapt to. But I mean, you guys are legends. I go back, and you did have a great, a, a tough team. I watch Bird Dogs tape. Some of the stuff is absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, in that eighty nine ninety season. Uh, uh, Kivel, you had what thirty-seven penalty minutes over the eighteen games you were down there. Bird Dog played forty-nine yeah. and had two hundred and thirty-five pims. <laughs> yeah, well, the there thing- was there was a time when I went down the second time when I was down there and Rob Stork was coaching. So we went down and I think I'm down there for I don't know six or eight games and I I get like six goals, six assists, and I went down to play. I was actually getting a chance to play again because you know you get up in the NHL, you're put on a roll, and that's all yeah. you're going to do. So now I get down here, Robbie's playing me. And, and this is me and Bird Dog because it was, you know, it was probably the first time I really get to hang out with Bird Dog. And we're, we're you know, for that three weeks, we're, we're pretty, that's when we got pretty close together. It was, you know, his, his David Wilcox music he was playing in the dressing room. Oh, so I God, got to learn that it. shit from David Bird. David Wilcox, Frank uh, Zappa. But, yeah, and then we, and then there was a thing. So I, I get on a little bit of a streak. And back in the day, we all, we all followed wrestling, too, in the point. And there was these two guys named the Bushwhackers. Uh, really? yeah, and so the Bushwhackers had come to the ring. Bushwhackers would come to the ring and they'd be having their hands going up and down in the air the whole time. So I told Bird Dog, I said, Bird Dog, hey, when I fucking score, I'm going to score a goal here. I said, I'm going to come to you and I want you to be coming towards me and we'll fucking do the Bushwhackers and give a high five. <laughs> so we we fucking go on this thing. So in the sixth game, that's pretty well score every game. So we're fucking doing the bush. There's, no there's way! Ronnie that's Pretorius fucking awesome. Fucking shaking his head. <laughs> that is unbelievable. I love that. But it was it was priceless. Um, um, the last question I got before you get back to your uh, son there, and good luck with that. Uh, you know, your your career followed an odd tra- not an odd trajectory, but it's sandwiched by point years. I uh, look in the WHL. You had a point a game, which is not easy to fucking do, no matter how tough you are. And in the United League, you finished with or close to. You know, nearly a point a game, or actually over a point a game. So when did you, and, and I, I believe, didn't do my research on this, but I believe you were a fifth or sixth round pick. So when did you realize, Kimby, uh, you know, coming through, you know, you're in the NHL, okay, now I can make the transition because I'm tough enough to be a tough guy in the NHL. Because, I mean, it was an option for you to be a a, a second liner at, at, at many points. I mean, you know, anybody who gets a point a, point a game and is tough, you know, can can do either kind of thing. Now, you 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 solidified your role as one of the toughest, uh, but you know, on the way there, there must have been times where you know you're thinking, you know, maybe I'll catch on and I'll I'll be this role or that role. Or did you know right from the beginning, you know, I'm in junior and I'm I'm cleaning out these guys that I'm going to be a contender at the top level. I you know I I think one my last year in Prince Albert when you know everything pretty well clicks for me and I. You know, I have 35 goals, 36 assists. I think I have yeah. 35 fights in that year, too. It's a major so, year. Yeah, 307 I, I, penalty minutes. Yeah. I, yeah. And then that, we didn't count the 10-minute misconducts back in the day, either. So, we we're you know, there was a lot of shit going on. And But I was I was getting to play, and, and I've always, I always struggled. My skating was always my hard thing to do. I, I wasn't the greatest skater. Like, I had enough to get by, but... When I was in Quebec, I was playing for Michel Bergeron, and I and I loved playing for Michel Bergeron. He was he he loved the tough guy. Um, he played me. Yeah. Uh, so when I went into Quebec, you know, we weren't doing great. So it was a great opportunity. Joey Sakic's there, and uh, Guy Lafleur is there, which is my all-time hero. So I'm fucking loving life. I'm I'm playing on a regular basis. Um, I, you know, I'm getting on the power play with Bergie and everything, and all of a sudden, you know how this thing, the whole story goes. So then all of a sudden, the coaching change goes on, and Bergie gets fired, and another guy comes in, and yeah, and then shit just went the other way. And then, so then I get traded because uh, things weren't going well with Chambers in Quebec. And I go to St. Louis when Holly's scoring his 86 goals. And Ugh. so I wow. sort of get caught in a, on a team now. 
And I, you know, when I got with Brian, and I like Brian Sutter a lot, and uh, I, cause I like his intensity and everything. And I just, you just got labeled a guy that, that back in that day you were going to play. You're lucky to get fucking five shifts a game if you got that, and and you couldn't get out of it. It just you were sat there, and it, no matter what the hell was going on, that's where you were going to sit. And so you, you either you had to live with it, and I lived with it for a long time. I went to Chicago eventually, and played to the other side of brother Daryl, who I didn't like at all, and I, but uh, basically I finally got fucking tired of it. So I. You know, and I I always refer back guys to guys like Craig Bruby and uh, Rob Ray and Ty Domi and these guys that played a lot of fucking hockey games. To play like Bruby played a thousand and some, and he didn't always play, but to be that mentally fucking strong to to fight it through and knowing yeah. you're not going to play much hockey because you know as well as I do when you start this journey, you want to play hockey. Hockey was your that you wanted to play. You watched it on TV. You wanted to be like the Gila players and that. Yes. Uh, you you had to go a different route to get into the NHL which I understand, but it was just hard to sit there on the bench all the time. And, um, you know, you're happy to be there, but you wanted to be part of it and you weren't getting a chance to be part of it. Well, uh, that's a great, honest answer. And um, if nothing else, I just wanted to bring that up because I often say, you know, a lot of guys up there that are doing the job, uh, you don't realize that, you know, they were great players. At one, not, that, not that you're not a great player, but it, it often goes unnoticed. You know, when you're getting one or two ships, mm -hmm. you know, I bring it up. You know who told me that? Actually, the part I said at the beginning, I said a lot of people didn't want to fight you. Darren Langdon. We were having a beer a few years ago, and I was asking about you and Tony Twist and all these guys. Because Langer came through at that same era. And, you know, he said some yep. of these guys would have had more. Pay I, I just noticed sometimes. I'm like, wow, that's weird. You know, Tony Twist yep. only had 100 well, minutes know, that year. And he'll say a lot of guys didn't want to fight I'll, him. And, and, you know, a lot of them. Uh, I'll get, I'll yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a prime story. The, the guy we're talking about today, Bird Dog. Per, per, I, I fuck. I lived with Bird Dog in Chicago. I lived with in Quebec. You know, there was a there's a lot of shit that we talked about because you know we're we're pretty well the same guy. We we you know we, yeah. we enjoyed the same fucking things. We enjoyed golf. We enjoyed playing pool. We you know the we were the yeah. same person, but we, we liked everybody. But if you fucked with us, we didn't like that. Great but Bird Dog it. was the same way. Bird Bird Dog could play the game of hockey, and he got when he gets up there. You know, they they throw the last few on him and say well, we only want you here to do this. And so, you know, I, you know, I would sit in the car many nights and we'd drive home, me and Bird Dog, from playing the same uh, game. And, and you know, he's getting four shifts back there. I'm getting fucking four shifts up there. And, you know, it, we, we were actually people that got to talk to one another about, because we did the same role. Uh, we, we, you know, we were going through the same things. And, and it was frustrating. And Bird had fucking tough time with it too. And, you know, he, 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 he did a couple things. You know, coaches got pissed off at him. And, but Bird Dog fought back a bit, which would probably hurt him a little bit. And, I think he'd own up to that himself. He uh, would, yeah. He, would. he owned up to. He, he told it. He told me about it, and and I say the same thing. I did the same fucking thing. You know, I. It's a hard game to play because you want to be part of something and you just don't feel part of it. And you know, Bird Dog, and 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 I was the same way as Bird Dog, and we just, you know, we're happy go lucky people, but we just want to be part of something. That's all. Well, you know, I really appreciate you. That's open. That's honest, and that's exactly something like he would say. I've been trying to explain that all day you know with the mm -hmm. guests we've had and that sums it up right there uh, and you know for you guys to be together i know what it's like bird helped me out bird when bird retired and i had a hard time i hurt my ankle i always thought you know i'll catch on with some other team i didn't see injury coming and he was one of the first guys and he called me and he told me all about it he said i went the second round do you think i, I was going to be ferocious my whole career he's like i went 22nd overall would have been first round today yeah and, you know and, and, he, and he it almost you know and not quite like you guys because you played with him and your roommates but it becomes therapeutic to have each other to talk to. Uh, and, yeah. and that's another thing that we'll have to focus on one episode, Mike, because would, uh, a lot of these guys, you know, I'll tell you, you only see the surface. Go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you when I, but you know, back in the day here with Trevor Steinberg, when he called me and told me bird dog wasn't doing well. And, and this was, you know, when I was, we lived with me and Eddie or me and bird dog lived with Eddie Belfort in Chicago. So we lived together, you know, we, so there's another year and a half that we lived and uh, played the game together. And we, so we went through a lot of shit there. And, and then when we got separated and, and this is, again, I'm not saying, you know, this is cause you know, the man yourself, it's, it's not that I, I, I didn't want to communicate with bird, but we were on our own fucking venture. And we we're just guys that you, you sort of lived in the moment. Cause you're fucking, as we talked about earlier in the show, you know, you get traded here, you sort of become a fucking hobo is what you do. And I'm not trying to be an asshole by saying no, that. No. I'm just, yeah, that's what you sort of, be, that's what you sort of become. So every time you go to a new adventure, you get new friends. It's not that you didn't like the old friends, but you, you just keep 
your life sort of just keeps going down the same fucking road. And you know, then I, when I finally, I get back to where I was and I finally got married and lived in St. Louis and I would talk to Eagle. And I, I never had bird. I, I, I didn't keep track of it. And this wasn't cause I didn't like birds. I love the man. Uh, but you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. And, and when, when I finally, when Trevor Steinberg gave me a call and told me about bird and, and then when I made the call to bird dog, you know, it was, it was like we'd fucking been talking yesterday and it, it was a, it was a pretty fucking hard go. Cause, uh, you know, bird dog, he broke down. I fucking broke down. It just, it's, it's yeah. cause you love the man. I, I know he respected me. and I respected him a lot. And it was just, uh, when I, when I fucking found out, it was something like fucking just ripped my heart out and I, I, I couldn't believe it. And, I was, you know, just because the life I live now and I work and I wanted to come out there and I was, I was just caught in a bad spot and I just, it was, it was about one of the worst fucking, it was like my family member was gone. So it, it was just tough. Well, look, we're, uh, we're having a beer for him today at, a, at a, his old watering hole. He used to come to on Saturdays. Uh, Kelly's, we're just going down over the hill now in a minute to do it. And I'll mention this to the guys. Kimmy, he talked about you. Uh, he said, me and Darren Kimball were good buddies and he used to tell me stories and he really thought a lot of you even before that phone call was made. Uh, and I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I hung out a lot with bird. I, I, he was a lot like me as well. And, uh, it's great to it's hear here. this because I, I, I can, you know, there's an energy from bird dog and, you know, now I'm starting, it's no fluke after talking to you and Theo Fleury, I can see why you're all buddies. Um, yep. you know, bird had that effect on people and look, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on, especially on a day like this. And, you know, for everything else, I'd yep. love to hear some of these stories. <laughs> so we'd love to have you on, uh, and that, uh, you know, any, uh, not any other time, but no, like, maybe, maybe sh you know, sometime maybe down the road 100%. after the season's over. Yep. We can have a chat in the summer and, uh, you know, about your ventures and about more bird dog and just about whatever hockey comes down the uh, I mean, plane. you're the first guy that we've had on the show that played for the Bruins, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you about playing for the 92-93 <laughs> Bruins, and that's really breaking yeah. my heart here, and I want to talk to you about that a lot. I, so I'll, we'll get I'll you back, back on to do that. Anytime you guys want me back on, I will. But I'll tell you, if you're going to do it bird dog fashion and with the drink, this is I'll, I'll, this is one of my probably the second time I ran into bird dog when I went down. My last story for you, I walked into my apartment, and Bird Dog and Maxie and these guys had already, I get there late, so they'd already been on one. And I walk into Bird Dog, and Bird Dog was drinking a Caesar at the time. And uh, he loved the Caesars and back in the day, because they, <laughs> they fucking, you know, the foam would sit there and his mustache and everything. But, and I'm sitting there, and I, I still don't know a lot about Bird Dog. And all of a sudden, we're, we're fucking sitting there. He drinks his Caesar. And then he fucking bites the fucking chunk of glass out of the top and fucking starts chewing on it. And I, and now I'm sitting, there, now I'm sitting there going, "What the fuck is wrong with this guy?" And he's sitting there chewing, bite, bite a chunk out of the glass and starts chewing on it. Yeah. But that was that was bird dog. So if you're if if you guys get fucked up enough, uh, get a Caesar and then chomp into a glass, and that'll be remembered very good. Great, what a great way to end things. Okay, buddy, thank you. Thanks so much, Darren. And uh, right. good luck to all uh, right, guys. Good luck to your kid with his stitches. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. You have a good day. All Thanks right. again. Cheers, buddy. buddy. Thanks. Yeah. Deadly. All right. Okay, let's... All right. Thanks again to uh, everyone who's been on today, Tommy, Theo, and and Darren, for coming on and chatting to us uh, about Greg Bird Dog Smith. Uh, we're so psyched. We're actually going to get ready, I guess, now and head down and meet Tommy and the boys at Kelly's, eh? Yeah, we're going to stop in. So uh, our guest from three weeks ago, Jim Cuddy, was nice enough to leave tickets for us. And tonight, uh, Mike and I get to use them. Chuck's out of town. Yeah, well, you know, and, that's, uh, that's it. He runs up to Toronto. The he goes to Toronto hey. Blue Rodeo. He's like, fuck it, Chuck's coming. We're going to Newfoundland. Yeah, yeah. He's out of town. It's safe to go. <laughs> like Curtis Blow said, that's the breaks, <laughs> Chuck. But we're uh, yeah, we're going to drop in there, and then we're going to go to Merchant Tavern and have a burger. And then we're going to head over and watch the show. But uh, today, in my mind, is all about Bird. And we're going to go down now and see some of his buddies, Jeremy Harp, Mike Manning, and Tommy Beckett in particular at Kelly's right now at his old stomping grounds. And uh, here, here's to you, Bird. We love you and uh, we miss you and we think about you every day, buddy. All right. We'll see you guys. We'll talk at you about hockey next week. Thanks. Worst crowd, worst crowd, yeah.